hey, if you want to learn Next.js, but you don't already know React and JavaScript and Node, uh, you're intimidated, you're not sure where to start, then this is the video for you. In this video, we're going to learn how to get your computer ready to use Next.js, how to use and understand JSX, or you know what even is JSX, how to use State and React for interactive features, how to fetch dynamic data server-side in Next.js, how to create custom and dynamic URL patterns in Next.js, how to use Tailwind CSS to create a fun layout and design, and how to have the content of your site uh, be edited by non-developers and non-programmers. Now, speaking of that last point, how to let non-developers you know, contribute to the content of your site, that ties into this video's sponsor, which is Strapi. Strapi is an amazing open source headless CMS or content management system, and it integrates perfectly with Next.js. Big thank you to Strapi for sponsoring this video. Now before we get started and jump into the action of this video, uh, let me show you a really quick sneak peek preview of the finished product of what we're going to be building together. So this is the home page. Uh, this is the Our Team page. On the Our Team page, you can click on any one of these to visit the detail screen for that team member. So this is Meowzalot's detail screen. Uh, there's a bit of, and again, all of this content can be edited. We'll see that in just a moment. Uh, but here is like a testimonial component. Uh, here is a spoiler component. The, you know, the content is blurred. You can click this button to reveal it. You can click that to rehide it or blur it. Uh, you can go back to all team members. We have an About Us page. Cool. Uh, down in the footer, uh, we have this click me button that shows you how to increment and you know keep track of something in state. And even as you navigate from page to page, uh, it remembers that piece of state. You can also see some fun background animations. That's Tailwind. That has nothing to do with Next.js. Anyways, we're going to use Strapi for the back end of this project. Uh, we're going to set all of this up in the video. So for example, someone who's not a developer or programmer, they don't know the first thing about React or JSX or Next they can come into this online dashboard and they can say, hey, I want to edit one of the team members. And there's, you know, meows a lot, barks a lot, purrs loud. They can click on one. So you can see there's just easy to fill out fields. They can upload a photograph. There's rich text, right, for paragraphs, uh, headings. We even create our own custom testimonial block with these custom fields where you can upload, like, the quote author. We have a custom spoiler component. And we're going to learn how to tie all of this in to Next.js so that it consumes that data, but it also uses its own Next.js components or React components for these custom bits of dynamic content. Anyways, the end result is this nice website that's powered by a dynamic data source. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun to set up, so let's jump into the action. All right, so the very first thing we're going to do is create a brand new, totally empty folder somewhere on your computer that you can easily find again. So for me, just on my desktop, I have this brand new folder. It's completely empty. I haven't done anything off camera yet. And then we're going to open up our brand new folder together in our text editor of choice. So I'm using VS Code. If you don't have VS Code, that's okay. You can pause this video right now and go visit the official website. It's completely free. It's the industry standard text editor. It's just code.visualstudio.com. Cool. So go ahead and pause the video, come back. Once you have VS Code and you've opened your entire folder in VS Code, then you'll have this left-hand sidebar area where you could like right-click and create new files or new folders. All right, perfect. Now before we move forward though, we need one other thing installed on our computer. We need something called Node.js. Now, you might already have Node installed, you know, if you were working through web dev tutorials a year ago. So to refresh your memory, in VS Code, if you press Control J or Command J, that'll open up your terminal, and then type this command in with me. Node, and then a space, two dashes, and then version. Go ahead and press Enter. If you see any kind of V and then a version number, great. That means you have Node, and you can move forward. If you see Command Not Found, just go ahead and pause this video, go to the official Node website, get it downloaded and installed, and you might need to restart VS Code, uh, but then you should be good to go. Awesome. At this point, we can move forward. So we've got our project folder open in VS Code. The very first thing we're going to do is create sort of a grocery list that keeps track of all the packages and dependencies that our project needs. So to do that, down in the command line, we say npm, and again, it's controller command J to toggle, like open and close your command line. But it's npm init-y. Go ahead and press enter. 
Cool. So this is like our grocery list. It keeps track of everything we need. Uh, now let's go ahead and install a few things. So we're just going to say npm install. Uh, we want next, right? This is a next JS tutorial. We also want react and then a space. We want, we want react dash dom. So we're installing three things, next, react and react dom. Go ahead and press enter. All right, so now we have all the ingredients we need to get started. Now let's manually create a few files and folders over in our sidebar here. So let's create a new folder and it needs to have this exact name. I'm not making this up. It needs to be app, A-P-P. All right, then inside that folder, let's create a new file and let's name it page.jsx. And again, I am not making this up. It needs to have this exact name of page.jsx. Cool. Inside that new page JSX file, let's say export default function. And let's just name it like uppercase page, uh, parentheses, curly brackets. In the body of our function, let's return a bit of JSX. Now, I'm going to assume this is your first time seeing JSX. So we're going to include parentheses so that we can break our code into multiple lines. Now, in between the parentheses, uh, what does JSX look like? For the most part, it just looks like HTML. So let's have like a div, and then inside the div, we can just, you know, maybe have like a heading level one that says, welcome. All right, let's go ahead and save that file, and then let's try to view this, uh, you know, actually in the web browser. So normally we'd have a command that we would just run down here to sort of fire up a local server, but we haven't set that up yet. So to set that up, we need, and this is just a one-time thing, you won't ever need to do this in your project again, but Initially, we need to go into package.json, and in this scripts area, we just need to add a few scripts. So there will be one called like dev, or build, or start. Now you could type these out manually, uh, but I actually like to just borrow or copy and paste the code from the official Next.js website. So if you go to their website and click get started, and then in the left hand sidebar, click installation. I'm not a big fan of automatic installation, so I always scroll down and follow the manual installation instructions. So you can see we've already performed this step, right? We installed the dependencies, and then this is the area I'm referring to. Now you don't need to select this entire object, but I would just select from the start of the quotes around scripts, just that little inner object, just copy that into your clipboard. Back in VS Code, just replace your existing scripts object, paste that in, and be sure to include a comma after that. Let's go ahead and save that, and now in the command line, you can just say npm run dev. Go ahead and press enter. That's going to spin up a local development server. And now back in your web browser, up in the address bar, just type in localhost colon 3000. Press enter. Perfect. So it's not very exciting, but there we see our heading level one that says welcome. Now what's really cool is we have automatic, uh, like the page is gonna refresh for us. So if you go back into page JSX and you know, you change this to say, hello, as soon as I hit save, awesome. I didn't have to refresh, it just gets automatically updated instantly. And that's not just for HTML, right? That's our JSX, so that's JavaScript, that's CSS. It is everything. It's a great, amazing developer experience. Cool. Now let's give ourselves a new goal. We have a basic web page up and running. Now let's try to set up a link so that you can click back and forth between two separate pages, you know, or two separate URLs. However, before we go ahead and create that second page that we can link, you know, back and forth from, let's set up sort of like a shared header and a shared footer that all of our pages will have in common. Let me show you how you do that in Next.js. Typically, you would create your own new file in the app folder called Layout. However, because we didn't create one, but we went ahead and created a page JSX file, the next framework sort of automatically created this file for us, this layout.js file. You can jump into it, and this, as you might expect by the name, this controls the layout for your overall app, right? Sort of the HTML skeleton, and then children represents like the current page that you've navigated to. So check this out, within our new layout.js file, uh, let's drop down on separate lines within the body element and maybe above this children area, this is where our header could be. For now, let's just have a div that says uh, header and then below the children area, so right about here, let's just have a div that says footer. If you're wondering why you can't use Emmet tab triggers, it's because this file ends in .js instead of .jsx. Let me show you what I have in mind here. So you could save this file 
and then rename it to be uh, layout.jsx instead of the just.js. And now if I reopen that, now I should have emit tab triggers. Yep, so you could type like div, hit tab, you get the idea. Cool, let's go ahead and save this though. And then if we, well, we don't even need to refresh on the front end, now we have our global header, our global footer, perfect. Now let's learn how to link between uh, like our homepage and then maybe like a slash about us page. So here's what you do. In the app folder, we create a subfolder and imagine we wanted the link to be like slash about us. So you just create a folder with that name and then in that new subfolder, you create a file and it has to have the name of page.jsx. So we made up about us, but we did not make up this file name. Now, to save some typing in this brand new file, you could just use your existing page.jsx as sort of boilerplate, copy it over, paste it over, and then just have this say, hi, this is the about page. Let's give that a save. Now back in the browser, up in your address bar, if you add on a slash and then type in, you know, about dash us and press enter, cool. So that works, but now let's create a link that you can click on, you know, to switch back and forth between the two pages. Now you might think to yourself, hey, I already know how to add a link, you just use the A element. And that absolutely would work. We could just, let me show you really quick. You know, so back in layout.jsx, up in our header, we could have like an A element uh, that goes to about us and says about page. And then we could have, you know, another A element uh, that just goes to slash for the home page. Uh, so you could save that and now when I click on home, you get the idea, right? Like I can navigate. However, we don't wanna do this. We don't wanna use the traditional A element for a link because this would defeat almost 99% of the reason of using Next.js in the first place. Because a traditional A element performs a full old fashioned page reload. It is reloading and re-rendering the entire page with like a whole separate HTTP request. That's not what we want. We want client-side JavaScript to handle, you know, any of these subsequent page actions or navigations that we're performing. So here's how you would do that in the world of Next.js. In our layout.jsx file, or just anywhere where you're wanting to link between pages, up at the top of the file, just say this with me, import uppercase link from quotes, and then it's just next slash link. So now instead of the A element, we have this uppercase link element. So check this out, like change this to an opening, you know, uppercase link and then match, you know, a closing link there. Do the same thing for this one, uppercase link. So we can save this and go back. And now notice it's not a full page reload. And the easiest way to see this, in my opinion, well, first of all, you can see there's not like that one millisecond of the content flashing. But if you go into your dev tools, click inspect, and then just down in the console, say like two plus two. So this will stay there now, even as you navigate from page to page, that's proof that it's not re-rendering the entire document. At this point, I wanna spend just 20 seconds to appreciate how cool this is. Uh, let me explain. So like for the example, on the home page, this is not being rendered by client-side JavaScript. So if you click view page source, and you command F or control F, there is the actual old fashioned, very traditional HTML being sent over and rendered, you know, from the server side, not client side JavaScript. And as we know, real old fashioned HTML like this is great for ser uh, search engine optimization, for accessibility, this is amazing. So when you very first load a page, like or if I click about page and then actually, you know, refresh, click view page source, you know, there is the old fashioned server side render server sent over HTML. So we're having our cake, but then for any subsequent navigations, it's 100% client powered. So we're eating it too. We're having our cake and eating it. This is the best of both worlds. This is an amazing developer experience. And you and I didn't have to do anything. The next JS framework has just got us covered. The best part is that now we have one unified template system, right? JSX, that we can use for both old fashioned server side sent over HTML and dynamic modern, you know, react interactive components. It's the best of both worlds, it's awesome. So having said that at this point, the natural question that you might have right now is, well, how do I actually use the power of react? Like, how do I actually have something interactive on the page or like, how do I have React keep track of my state? 
Well, great question. Right now, let's give ourselves an example task. Let's add something in our footer uh, that keeps track of how many times you've clicked a button. So let's, let's have a button down here, and every time you click it, it increments it and says, you know, you have clicked this button zero times, or one time, or two times, or three times. So to set that up, let's find our footer code down here, and let's clear out that div. First of all, let's just have a paragraph that says, you know, like maybe the copyright symbol, and just say like our company. And then maybe below that paragraph, let's have another paragraph that says, uh, you have clicked the following button, uh, let's just say zero times. And then still in that paragraph, we can just have a button element that says, click me. All right, so you can save that, check it out, look something like this. So now anytime you click this button, how do we actually have it increment uh, this number? One, two, three, how would you do that? Well, we want to use a tool in React called use state. We want to keep track of this value or this piece of data as a piece of state or application state. However, if we tried to use state from within this file the way it's currently set up, we would run into about three different errors. Now, don't worry, before we move on to our next feature, I'm going to make sure that you absolutely understand what's going on. But just for the next 10 seconds, stay with me here. I actually want to split our footer into its own separate file. And then from there, we can learn how and why to use state in React within Next.js. Don't worry, I promise in a couple of minutes from now, this will all make perfect sense. So let's do this. In the root of our folder, let's create a new subfolder. And you could name it anything, but just for organization, why don't we call it components? So the idea is that we can split out little sub elements or subsections of our code into their own organized components. So in our brand new components folder, let's create a new file and let's name it uppercase footer.jsx. Inside this new file, let's say export default function and let's name it uppercase footer parentheses curly brackets. In the body of the function, we're going to return parentheses. In those parentheses, we can have a bit of JSX. So you can just go back into layout.jsx and just grab uh, this div area. This was our footer code, right? So just the entire div section, just cut that into your clipboard. Back in our new file, just paste that right here. Let's save that file. And then back in layout.jsx, let's import our footer and then use it or include it right here. So up at the top of this file, I'd probably say import, you know, uppercase footer from quotes. And a little bit later in this video, I'll show you a super organized way of uh, spelling out your paths when you're importing another file. But for now, I don't want any extra steps in this moment to, you know, bog us down. So let's just say dot dot slash to go up out of the app folder and then just go into the components folder and then grab uppercase footer. You could include .jsx, but you don't need it. So we don't need the .file extension, just uppercase footer. Uh, with that imported though, now we can use it down here. So instead of like a P element or a div element, we can just have a self-closing uppercase footer element. So in React, when you create a component, you're essentially creating your own custom type of element. So now you can save that. Cool, looks good. And then just to prove to yourself that it's working, you could go into footer. And maybe let's add the year here. So let's say like copy and then like instead of hard coding the year to do something dynamic, you could say curly brackets. And then let's have a new instance of the date class. And then at the end there call get full year. You can give that a save. Cool. So there's the year. We're proving that this is coming from our footer component file. Awesome. Now let's get to the actual task at hand. How can we increment this uh, every time we click this button? Well, here's what you would do. In React, up at the very top of this file, you would say import curly brackets, something called use state from uh, the React library. However, if we save that, we are going to run into an error. Yep, there you see, failed to compile. The reason we're running into this error is actually great news. So by default, Next.js is not making React available. Like it's not making all of the client side goodness of React available on your website. It is using like old fashioned server rendered, you know, traditional server sent over HTML. And essentially what I'm getting at here is it's opt in. If we actually want to use the client side nature of React, we have to opt in. 
Now that might seem annoying or like an extra pain in the developer experience, but trust me, it's actually a good thing. It's optimizing the speed of our website. It's making sure that throughout the, you know, the tree, like all of the different elements and the DOM components of our website, it's making sure that as small of a little area as possible is opted into client side react. It wants, you know, the majority of your site to just be um, server rendered, not client rendered, but uh, within our footer component, and this is again why I uh, created our own component, I would not want, you would never, ever, ever want, well, I should say never, but 99% of the time, you would not want your overall layout to use uh, client-side JavaScript. Instead, the little tiny portion that needs client-side interactivity, you create that as its own component, like its own little bite-sized area, and then that little tiny area can opt in to using client-side. Now, how do we actually opt in? Simple, within footer, uh, we wanna opt in, we just say quotes, use client, and you need to make sure this is the very first line of code in your file, but that's it. Just quotes, use client. If I save this, Cool, we don't see any error messages. And now within our footer component, we can use you know typical client side React. So here's what we would do. We can leverage use state. Uh, within our function here, before the return, uh, let's create a piece of application state. Uh, so let's say const square brackets, and let's say count comma set count, and let's set that equal to, and then call use state. And let's give it an initial value of zero. And now down here in our text, we don't want this to be hard coded to zero. Curly brackets for something dynamic, we would want that to be the count. Okay, and then anytime you click on this button, we would just wanna increment this value. So here's what I would do. On the button, uh, we can just give this an on click equals curly brackets. And this function doesn't exist yet, but we can go create it in five seconds from now. Let's call it like handle click. This is not a React term, I just made this up. This could be zebra or unicorn. But now let's go create uh, a function with that matching name. So we just have a function inside of a function. Right about here, before our return line, we can say function, handle click, parentheses, curly brackets. In the body of our function, we're just going to use set count. So call set count. And then we can clean up this syntax, but just to make it obvious what's going on here, we're actually going to call an anonymous function inside of that because we're trying to access the previous value. So React is gonna give us access to the previous value. And then in our function, we would just say return, you know, that previous value plus one. But we can clean up this syntax a lot. So instead of actually saying the word function here, we can get rid of that. And if you only have one parameter, you don't need the parentheses around it. And then we can have an arrow symbol here and then if this sits on the same line as this, you don't even need the word return here. So we could get rid of these curly brackets here and here. We could get rid of the word return, just have it sit on a single line. And then this closing parentheses could sit on all on the same line, just like this. So now this selected bit of code, cool. So we can give that a save and let's test it out. So I know Next.js automatically refreshes for us, but I had to manually click refresh right here in order for this to work. But there you can see, Every time we click the button, we increment our value. Perfect. Now, what's really cool here is, you know, that's a piece of application state. And anytime you refresh, you're gonna lose that. It just stays in the browser's memory, you know, until you actually perform a full reload. However, if I click this up to a certain number, you know, seven, and then I click back and forth between the home page and about page, again, this is further proof that we are not having a full page reload. This is a single page application experience. We're keeping the current you know, in memory values, but we're navigating from page to page. Awesome. At this point, let's change gears. Now let's work on having our page actually be visually appealing. So let's work on the design or the CSS. Now I realize you might not be interested in this portion of the video, so please feel free to use the timestamps down below to skip ahead to the next chapter, right? You might only be interested in uh, how to pull data from a dynamic source or an API. We're gonna use Strapi as a content management system. Feel free to skip ahead to that portion. Uh, but if you're interested in CSS, design, tailwind, so on and so forth, then you'll probably enjoy the next you know, 10 or 20 minutes. Otherwise, that's the whole point of timestamps. Cool. So right now, how do we make things look nice? Well, in Next.js, you have a lot of different options in terms of how you want to add your CSS or styling. You can have global CSS, you can have CSS modules, you can have CSS in JavaScript or SAS, but personally, 
I'm a big fan of Tailwind CSS. So there's no right or wrong answer, but this is the approach I'm going to take in this tutorial. Cool. So if you just Google for how to add Tailwind to Next.js, this first result from the official Tailwind CSS website has excellent instructions. So let's just walk through this. So the first thing we would do is just run this command. You don't need to visit this page. You can just type out what I'm about to do and follow along with me. So in our command line, again, that's controller command J to toggle your command line. Press control C to stop the current dev task. And then type in this command with me, npm install. And then you can include a dash uppercase D to say that these are dev dependencies. Uh, but the packages we want are tailwind CSS space. We also want post CSS space. We also want auto prefixer. Go ahead and press enter. Okay, after that, we want to run this npx tailwind command. So again, you can just follow along with me. By the way, I'm just typing clear so that my cursor is back up here instead of way down here falling off the edge of the screen. But now we're going to say npx tailwind css init dash p. Go ahead and press enter. Cool. That command created this new file for us called tailwindconfig.js. And now we do need to spell out uh, in this content area where our files live uh, that will contain the class names we're looking for. So uh, you can Google for this page. Again, that was uh, how to add Tailwind to Next.js. So just one Google search away. But from that page, this area has the exact uh, code that you can copy and paste. So it's you know content colon and then square brackets. So I would just copy that into my clipboard. And then in tailwind.config.js, just replace this empty content. Perfect, you can give that a save. And then I think there's just one step remaining. Yes, so we need to create a global CSS file on it and then add these three directives. It doesn't matter exactly where we create our global CSS file, but I would probably just create a, a new folder in the root of our project and call it uh, assets. Could name it anything, uh, but then in that assets folder, I'll create a new file and you could name it global or you know I might just name it like main.css. In that file, uh, we just want these three Tailwind directives, so just copy those into your clipboard, paste them in here, hit save. Okay, and now we just need to go into our layout file and import or include uh, our new CSS file. So in layout.jsx, up at the very, very top, say this with me, say import quotes, say dot dot slash to go up out of the app directory, and then go into assets, and then grab main.css. We can give that a save, and if you go back to the browser, whoops, you won't see any changes, and if you refresh, it's actually, you know, site can't be reached because we need to restart up our dev task. So in the command line, it's just npm run dev. Go ahead and press enter. That'll spin it up. We can hide our command line now. You can refresh back in the browser. Whoops, my reload button wasn't working. I had to actually click on the address bar and press enter. I'm not sure if that was a bug or what's going on, but cool. So now you can tell by the fact that there's no margin or styling on anything that Tailwind is indeed working. All right, let's spend the next little bit of time actually creating you know, a visually appealing layout for our header, our footer, our main content area, you know, like our navigation links, so on and so forth. The first thing I wanna set up is the overall skeleton. In other words, you know, the header should take up about this much space, but then I also want the footer to actually be at the bottom of the page, even if the main content area doesn't have enough content to actually push it down that far, right? So just sort of the overall uh, skeleton of the page. So here's what I would do. In our layout.jsx file, here's our header, there's the main content area, and there's the footer. Uh, so I'd probably wrap the main area, this children, uh, you know, dynamic area, I'd probably wrap that in a main tag. So let's move the closing tag to be after that. So there's header, main, footer. And if I want to manage the heights of these elements and control like the ratio so that this takes up most of the available height, we probably want all three to sit in a grid container. So what I would do is just have uh, sort of a container div and then just move the header, main, and footer to all live inside of that div. And then on sort of that overall container div, let's give it a class of 
And now I'll let you know in JSX, you, you actually cannot use this attribute of just class like you normally would with HTML and CSS uh, because class is a reserved word in JavaScript. In JSX, we actually have to say class and then uppercase N, so class name, just like this. Cool, but then we can give it CSS classes just like we normally would. Uh, but let's say like BG Gray 200, and let's give it a minimum height, of, and then let's give it an arbitrary value, so square brackets, and let's say 100 dynamic viewport height units, so DVH. All right, and then we'll also give it a class of grid and grid rows dash and then square brackets for an arbitrary value. And now I'm gonna list three values. So the first value is essentially how tall I want the header to be. The second value will be how tall I want the main area to be. And the third value is you know how tall the footer should be. So in other words, we're gonna say auto underscore auto underscore auto uh, for just sort of like their default height. But then the second auto, we don't actually want that to be auto. This would be the main, uh, you know, the main area. I'm going to set that to one FR, meaning just all available remaining space after everything is taken up its natural size. Cool. So let's save that and see what that gets us. Cool. So now the main content is taking up this available space and the footer is actually at the bottom of the page. At this point, I'm ready to start making the header actually look nice. So let's go back into layout. So this is the overall container, but this is the header area. Instead of a div, we could let this use the semantic, you know, header tag. Uh, but let's just start giving it class name. So class name equals, let's say BG dash white forward slash 50. So this is like 50% transparent white. So if we save that, Cool, you can see the subtle gray color of the overall page, but the header uh, has this white background. Next, I wanna set things up so that, yes, the white background color takes up the full available width of the browser viewport, but let's center the actual content to maybe like, you know, just the inner center portion of the page. So here's what I would do. Inside of header, I would just take our existing content and wrap it inside a wrapper div, and let me paste the content back in. On that wrapper div, let's give it a class. So class name equals, and I'll just give it a max width. So max W, let's go like 4XL, and then MX dash auto to center it. Cool, so that already gets us, right? It's now, uh, the content is actually centered. Perfect. Now I want uh, sort of our header logo to sit here, but I want the navigation links to sit on the right side. So here's what I would do. So first of all, let's give uh, the header, like the logo itself that you can click on to go to the homepage. Let's put that in a heading level two and it can say like our cool project. We can style that in just a moment. And then below that, I'm gonna actually get rid of these links and just reset it up. Let's have a nav element. And then inside that we'll have an unordered list. And then, you know, that'll contain multiple list items. And then inside that, that would have a link element. Uh, so the first one can be like, you know, home, and then href would just be slash. And then you can copy and paste that. So there's three of them. And then this one can just be like uh, our team. And then this one can be about us. And then just update the href. So like our team, this one would be about us. Cool. So if we save that and see what that gives us. All right, so this is the heading level two, the logo. I want it to be on the left side, but I want the navigation items to sit over here. So here's what I would do. On our div that has the max width and MX auto, I would just tell it to use flex. And then I'd say items dash center to like uh, center them vertically, but then to have it so the content is, you know, split up between the left and the right, you just say justify between. Perfect. All right, then for our navigation, we don't want each one of these sitting on their own line. So what I would do to fix that is on the unordered list, just tell it to have not, its children, um, you know, not sit one per line. So I'd say class name equals flex. So that alone gets us this, perfect. Then I want a bit of a gap or space in between each one. So I'd just say gap X, you know, X meaning the X axis like left and right. Uh, let's go with like seven. And then I'll also have that text not be black. Let's set it to like gray 500. Perfect. 
Let's have this use a slightly smaller font. So on the unordered list, we could also give it a class of text-sm for small. And then let's bump up this font size a bit. So in layout, I would just find that heading level two. That's our logo. I would say class name equals text-2xl. Let's say text gray 500, and let's give it some vertical padding. Perfect. Next, let's have these links be a bit of a lighter gray, and then when you hover over one of them, they can get a bit darker. So here's what I would do. For example, here's our home link. I would probably say, you know, class name. Let's go with opacity-50, and then for a hover in Tailwind, you say hover colon, and then the class name you would want for hover. So opacity, maybe like, uh, you know, dash 65. So home is light, but when I hover over it, it gets a bit darker. Now here is where duplication and Tailwind and Next.js all come together. So you might think, ah, oh, Tailwind is horrible because now I have to manually, you know, copy that and like paste it to these other three links. And you know, then cool. So now it's actually the way we would want it. Only you're probably thinking like, well, that's a lot of duplication. What if I had like, you know, six or seven or 10 navigation links? And then what if I wanted to change this? Do I really have to change it for all of them one by one? Well, this is why React components in Next.js, I think, work together perfectly with Tailwind. What I would do to reduce all of this duplication is just create my own sort of navigation link component uh, and then just spell it out once and then reuse that component. Let me show you what I mean. Go ahead and copy one of these links into your clipboard, you know, so the opening link to the closing link. Copy that into your clipboard. And then in our components folder, let's create a new file and let's name it. I mean, we can make this up. We could call it anything, but let's call it like navlink.jsx. In that brand new file, let's say export default function, you know, navlink uppercase, and then return parentheses in the parentheses, paste in your clipboard. Okay, go ahead and give that a save. And then back in layout.jsx, uh, up at the top, let's import that component. So we could say like, import nav link from quotes dot dot slash components slash nav link and then we can use that down here so instead of actually spelling it out you would just say you know uppercase nav link it could even be self-closing and then i would just have that for all three instances so just replace all of those now at first it's just going to say if we save that's going to say home 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 Oops, actually, we forgot to uh, import link inside of our component. So going to navlink up at the very top, you would just say import link from next slash link. All right, so at first it's going to say home, home, home. But now this is where we just make our component dynamic. Check it out. Back in layout, you can just start giving these props or properties. So on the first one, we could say like, you know, and I'm just making this up. This could be unicorn or zebra or pizza, but let's say like text equals home. And then let's, you know, text equals like the clickable text, the human readable text is like what? Our team. And then this one can be uh, about us. So we can save that and then go back into the nav link component. And then when we're creating the overall function in these parentheses, let's just have a parameter. It's, you know, customary to name it props short for properties. And then inside here, instead of hard coding this to home, let's have curly brackets for something dynamic and then just say props dot and we named it text. So now we can save that and back on the website. Cool, each instance of the component is using that unique prop value. Perfect. Now let's do the same thing for the actual uh, link value, right? Like the href value. So back in layout, on each one of these instances, you could give it, and again, you could make it up, call it pizza, unicorn, whatever, but let's call it like path. And so home would be slash, but then like for our team, that would be path equals, you know, like slash our team. And then about us could be path equals slash about dash us. And then you can use that in here. So then href, uh, would equal, instead of equaling quotes, when you want it to equal something dynamic, it's curly brackets for like a JavaScript expression or a JavaScript value, and then just props dot path. So we can save that, test it out. So uh, our team won't work yet. We haven't created that page, but you can go between home and about us. Perfect, you can see the actual unique content here changing. 
absolutely perfect. Why don't we go set up an Our Team page and then we can fill it in with real content a bit later. So what I would do is just, you could duplicate the About Us folder. Uh, so you can just click Copy and then on your keyboard press, you know, Control V or Command V to duplicate it. And then you can just rename it. So if you click on it and press Enter, we can just rename that one to uh, Our-Team. And then inside that page.jsx, you could say, you know, just for the example content, this is the Our Team page. Cool, so now you can actually click all three of our links. Awesome. Before we move on and start styling the actual main content area so that it actually looks visually appealing and you know setting up the footer styling, before we get to that, let's first set up a bit of styling so that you can tell which of these links is the current active page. Like if you're on the home page, this should be an even darker gray than the hover style. Or like if you're on the about us page, this should be you know a darker color and lit up. Let me show you how we can do that. So in our nav link component, inside our function but above the return line, uh, let's do this. Let's say const, and I'm just making this up, but let's call it like path name equals, and then for now you can just set it to an empty pair of quotes. We'll circle back to what we want this value to be in just a moment. But essentially, we want to be able to perform a comparison. We want to be able to compare this value with the current URL, right, like in the address bar that you've actually visited. So for example, like if you were on the About Us page, we're trying to see, is this a match with the current address bar? If it is a match, we want to give it a class that's, you know, darker than uh, 65. Like let's just make it fully dark, fully transparent, or I guess 0% transparent, you know what I mean, an opacity of 100, uh, so that it looks like the active page. So in order to perform that comparison between this value and the current URL address bar, here's what we need to do. Up at the top of our file, after we import link, let's say import curly brackets, and I'm not making this up, this needs to be exact. Use, and then uppercase P for path, and then lowercase n for name. So use path name, import that from, and then next slash navigation. Now, within our function here, that not just quotes, we would say path name equals, and then we call use path name, parentheses to call it. Now, if we try to save this, we will run into an error message. So if I save that, yes, failed to compile. This is because use path name only works in client components. So that's another great reason why we separated navlink into its own component. Up at the top here, we can just opt into uh, use client. Cool. So now we don't run into any errors and now we can just compare uh, this value with this value. So on the next line I just say like const and again I'm making this up it could be anything but let's say like active and then I want it to equal either true or false like is the current link the current navigated to page true or false. So I would just say equals you know path name triple equal signs prop dot props dot path. Cool. Now down here, let's just apply different classes depending on whether this is true or false. So you can get rid of this uh, class name equals. Instead of quotes, let's say equals curly brackets to do something dynamic. And then let's just use a ternary operator. So the condition, that will either be true or false, question mark. And then what do you want to output if it's true? I would just say like opacity dash 100. After that, colon, what do you want to output if it's false? Let's say like opacity dash 50, hover colon opacity dash 65. Let's give this a save and test it out. Cool, so I'm on the about us page, so it's darker. If I go to the our team page, it's the active page, so it's dark. If I go to home, awesome, you get the idea. So now we've created this cool effect where it's really obvious which page you're on. I think our header is looking okay. At this point, let's change gears and let's work on the main content area. Uh, so we're going to want it to be, you know, center aligned, um, have like a transparent white background, a bit of padding, so on and so forth. We can make that happen by just going into layout.jsx and just giving a few classes to this main element. So on the opening main tag, let's just say class name equals, and first of all, let's give it a max width. So max dash W dash four XL. Uh, let's center it horizontally. So MX dash auto. Uh, let's give it BG white slash 50 for a, you know, 50% transparent white. Uh, let's give it rounded corners, so rounded dash XL. 
Uh, let's give it a good amount of vertical padding. So like PY7. Uh, let's give it even slightly more horizontal padding. And then I'll give it margin on all four sides, all four directions. And then let's say overflow hidden. Uh, just because we have rounded corners, so any content uh, that's in the very edges, I would want to sort of respect the rounded corners. Let's give that a save and see what that gets us. So it looks good other than the fact that it's way too narrow. We would want it to take up, you know, this amount of width. And that's just because it's sort of shrink wrapping around, you know, the single word of hello. So if you just went into your home page, uh, so just not in the just in the app folder page.jsx below the heading one if you gave it like a paragraph and then just typed in lorem and hit tab you know just for a good amount of filler content perfect takes up you know the exact amount of space that you'd want to see and then you could do the same thing for your other two pages um, so in our team you just give it a paragraph do the same thing for about us paragraph lorem hit tab cool all right at this point, let's uh, get our footer looking nice. So we have a separate footer component. So in footer.jsx, let's wrap this overall div inside sort of a container semantic uh, footer tag. So the closing tag would go down here. On the footer tag, let's say class name equals uh, BG white slash 50. And then on the inner div, that's where we can give it, you know, the max width and the centering and all that. So I would say, uh, MX dash auto max width 4XL. Let's say text center. Let's give it a bit of vertical padding. Let's say the text should be small. Let's say the text should be like text gray 400. Let's see what that gets us. Cool. Now, obviously, you could give the button some styling if you wanted to, but even just clicking this, even though it doesn't look like a button, it still works just the same. Cool, so I clicked it 22 times and I'm free to navigate between my various pages. It keeps that value in memory because we're using client-side JavaScript. This is great. Our styling is almost complete. Before we move away from the styling and move on to the Strapi or the content management system integration, I wanna do one last thing. I wanna have some fun blurred uh, colorful circles that sort of gradually animate around in the background. Uh, because that's really going to show off the nature, the single page application nature of our project, right? So this way, even as you're navigating from page to page, there's these cool circles and their position doesn't reset as you click from page to page. They continuously like smoothly move with, without any interruption. I think it's just a fun way to show off uh, the spa nature of our project. So again, if you're not interested in this, use the timestamps, but let's spend maybe the next five minutes adding some fun uh, animated shapes in the background. Here's how I would set that up. Let's go into our layout.jsx file, and here's what I would do. Inside of our overall container that has BG Gray 200, but above our header, so right about here where my cursor is now, uh, let's add in a new div. So div hit tab. Inside of this div, let's have two other divs. Each interior div will be its own blurred circle. So maybe one can be pink and the other can be purple. Let's just start with one. Uh, so on this first inner div, let's give it a class name of, let's go with W64, that's for width 64. Let's give it a height 64. Let's go rounded full so that it becomes a circle instead of a square. Let's give it BG rows 400 slash 50% transparent. Let's have it at the very top of the page. So top dash zero. Let's have it come in from the right side, maybe like right dash 28. Uh, let's have it use absolute positioning and let's blur it. Actually, first let's see what it looks like without blurring it. Let's just save that and see what it gets us. Okay, so some good news, some bad news. So that is, you know, a light pink circle. However, the positioning is way off. It's making our header take up way too much space. And that's because now our vertical grid container is thinking that, you know, this is the first element and then the header, it's now thinking that the header should take up a lot of vertical space. So all we need to do to fix this is the overall div that we set up. Let's just give it a class name of absolute. That'll take it out of the grid system. And then let's also just tell this to be a Z index of zero. That way we can layer, you know, our header and our footer and our main content on top of it. We want the blurred circle sort of truly in the background. Uh, let's say inset dash zero. So that sets it to the very edges of the screen. And let's also say overflow hidden, um, just so as we animate the circles around, they don't cause uh, unwanted scroll bars. Let's see what this gets us. 
Cool, I like this. Now let's just be sure to go give the header and the main and the footer a higher Z index so that they sit on top of that layer. So uh, on header, I would just give this, uh, you know, like Z-10. Cool, that puts the header on top of it. And then I would do the same thing for the main element, just a class of like Z-10. Awesome, now it's sitting on top of it. Let's not forget about our footer. So in the footer component, on the overall tag, just give it Z-10. Awesome. Now let's go ahead and make this circle actually be blurred. So back in layout, uh, it's this element. We can just give it a class of blur-3xl. Nice. And then if you wanted to make it a bit less subtle, you could just bump up the opacity on that color. Uh, like BG Rose, instead of 50, you could put this to like 60. So it's a bit less subtle. Cool. Let's sort of duplicate that div, but let's have another one down about here and let's make it purple. So I would just duplicate uh, this element that we've been working on, just have it right below it. And then let's change the color to like BG Indigo. Uh, and then let's see, let's just change the positioning. So instead of top zero, let's say like bottom zero. And instead of right 28, let's say left 28. Nice, I really like that. Now, let's just have these blurred circle shapes uh, smoothly and sort of infinitely like animate around. Uh, so that way, even as we're navigating from page to page, uh, the animation proves to us uh, that it's like a seamless spa experience. So here's what I would do. On that first div, the first circle, let's give it a class that has nothing to do with Tailwind. That's uh, just a class name for you and I. So I'll call it like circle dash one. And while we're here, we can give the other circle, you know, circle dash two, just something for us to hook on to. So you can save that. And now let's go into the assets folder and jump into main.css. Now, I'm sure there's a more tailwind way of handling animations, but I'm just wanting to write my own, you know, super custom, super bespoke, like manually spelled out animation. So even though this isn't like a super tailwindish way of doing it, this is what I'm going with. So I'll just create a new rule here. I'll say circle dash one, and then I'm just gonna give it a property of animation. In 10 seconds from now, we can create an animation that has the name of uh, maybe like move one. And let's say spread it out over the course of 10 seconds, linear, and run an infinite number of times. Cool. Now let's just say key frames, and we named our animation move one. All right. Now let's just spell out, you know, when the animation is 0% of the way done versus, you know, 25, 50, 75, 100% done, let's just manipulate its transform translate and its scale uh, to make it look like it's moving around and like shrinking and, and expanding. So when the animation is first starting, let's say transform and then let's call translate, let's say 0 comma 0. After that, let's also call a scale of just one uh, semicolon at the end there. And now let's just duplicate this a few times. So like change this to 25% through the animation. Let's change this to like 200 PX uh, on both the X and Y coordinates. Keep the scale at 100. There's no science to this. This is just, you know, this is more art than science, but I think this will look nice. Uh, let's change this to 50. So I just pasted it in again. Halfway through the animation, let's put this to 100 PX and maybe like 400 PX and bump up the scale to like 1.2. And then let's just duplicate that again. Let's change it to 75% of the way through the animation. Let's change this to like negative 100 pixels and maybe like negative 200 pixels. Let's put the scale to 1.1. And then finally, 100% of the way through the animation. Uh, let's just duplicate that line one more time. And let's put translate back to like 0 0 and scale back to 1. Uh, let me go ahead and save that, see what that gets us. Cool. Uh, so you could speed it up instead of 10 seconds. If you wanted to like get a better feel for what that looks like, you could put this down to like three seconds and now you can see it's moving around very quickly. I mean, you can fine tune it all you want, but I'm gonna put that back to 10 seconds. And now let's create another animation for circle two. So I would just say like circle two, uh, you could just copy this property line, but let's create another animation named move two. And then I would just duplicate this keyframes area. So just copy all of it, paste it, change the copy name to like move to. And then I would just change, uh, so like this one could be like negative 30 
and negative 300. And then for 50% of the way through, we could say like negative uh, 200 and negative 100. And then this one could be like 30 PX and maybe like 70 PX. And then finally set it back. So we can save that, refresh it. Cool. So now they're both moving like independently, you know, in totally different directions and different patterns. I think this looks pretty cool. And it's painfully obvious now as you navigate from page to page uh, that this is a single page application experience. The animation is not getting interrupted or restarting. This is a really smooth experience. One last detail before we move on. I think it would look nicer if these uh, semi-transparent areas like the header and the main content and the footer, if they had a backdrop blur, they would almost look like the sort of like a glass effect, right? So check this out. Uh, maybe like on our header, where we have the class of BG white slash 50, you can say backdrop dash blur. And then let's also do that on our main element. Let's say backdrop, helps if you spell it correctly, backdrop dash blur. And then let's also do that for our footer. So save that file on this one. It would also be backdrop dash blur. Cool. So now uh, the area that's peeking through, it's even more blurred than just the circle being blurred. You could test this out by going into layout.jsx. And if I make you know that first pink circle, uh, if I got rid of its manual blur on it, you can see it's not blurred. But when it's you know like hiding behind these white frosted glass elements it looks blurred. I think that's a really cool effect. Um, so you could even make this like, instead of blur 3XL, you could like bring that down to like 2XL or you know maybe just blur XL, right? So it's less blurry than the part that's peeking through. But again, that's more of an art than a science. That's up to you. I'll put it back to 3XL, cool. At this point, I uh, just manually hit refresh. That's why the animation jumped, by the way. At this point, let's move on. Uh, this is ultimately not a tutorial about CSS animations. At this point, let's really change gears and let's talk about how we're gonna get the content for our various pages. Uh, because you and I, as a web developer, we're probably not the ones that are like contributing content, right? There's probably someone on the team or the company who is not a developer, but is gonna type up the content uh, or like, you know, for our team, maybe we want like different cards for each of our team members and we want like a photo, you know, a bit of a description for each team member and then you can click their link to, v to view like their full biography. And again, you and I as the programmer are probably not gonna be the ones entering and, you know, contributing all that content. Instead, we want our next JS website to sort of dynamically pull that raw data from some sort of other source. That's really the beauty and power of Next.js is that even if we had like a hundred or 200 different team members, you know, and each one had their own individual URL page for more details, Next.js can programmatically fetch that data and automatically create all of those separate, you know, routes and URL patterns and pages. So at this point, to really change gears, I want to let you know about the sponsor of this video, which is Strappy. Strappy is an amazing open source, headless content management system. Big thank you to Strappy for sponsoring this video. Now, how do we get started using Strappy? Strappy does have paid plans where they host um, the software for you up in the cloud. However, Strappy is also an open source solution, which means if you're willing to host it locally or you know host it yourself somewhere, then you can use it for free. In this video, we're going to see how it's super easy to install Strappy locally. Now, in the real world, you'd want your non-developer or non-programmer clients to be able to log into your content management system. In that case, you could check out Strappy's pricing, or you could go you know, buy your own $5 or $3.50 a month uh, VPS and host your own instance of Strappy, right? It's just amazing open source software. In this video, we're not going to worry about deploying Strappy to like a real, you know, hosted out in the real world uh, server somewhere. In this video, we're just going to get Strappy up and running locally. And then you could use your imagination or you could look up other tutorials on how you could host it publicly. So for the purposes of this video, we're just going to install Strappy on our personal computer and then sort of use Next.js as a static site generator that, you know, pulls in the latest version of our, our data. Right, the content uh, that we've contributed inside of the content management system. What's really cool is setting up a Strappy installation is as simple as just one uh, npx command. So you can do this with me. I'm just gonna create a brand new folder on my desktop here. 
You could name it anything, but I'm going to name it like our back end. So the idea is this is just a separate, you know, sort of folder or project from our next JS front end. Strappy is going to power our back end, you know, that clients could log into potentially. Anyways, just go ahead and open up this brand new empty folder in your terminal. All right, so here I have it open in my terminal, and then we're just going to say npx create dash strappy dash app at release candidate, so RC. Strappy is about to release a new version of their software, so this just makes sure we're using that new version. And then let's have a period to say, like, use the current folder that we're already in. Let's go ahead and press enter. All right, now in the real world, you might use Strappy Cloud, uh, but in our case, we're just running this application locally on our personal computer, so we can click this skip. You can use the arrow keys on your keyboard and just choose the skip option, press enter. Do you want to use TypeScript? That's up to you, but in this tutorial, I'm not going to, so I'm going to say N for no. Use the default database, SQLite, yes, absolutely. All right, and then it should just take, you know, maybe another 30 seconds. It's installing all of the dependencies from NPM. Should be a fairly quick process. All right, so you can see that mine has finished. And now to actually start up your backend server, all you do is say NPM run. And then instead of dev, they have uh, the script name as develop. So NPM run develop. Press enter. All right, and then it should automatically open up this address in your browser in a new tab. Just go ahead and sign up for your local admin account. Okay, once you submit that form, you now have your local admin account. And we now have our own back end. Uh, so you could use your imagination like if instead of on localhost, this was, you know, up on a VPS somewhere, uh, you could now, you know, have your clients who are not programmers, who are not developers, uh, log into this and start adding new content for your website. So throughout the remainder of this video, we're going to learn how to set up the different data types in Strapi and then configure our next JS project to sort of dynamically pull in data from Strapi's API endpoints. That way our website is truly powered by dynamic data. So where should we begin? Let's start with the Our Team section because I think it's the most interesting and we'll have the most fun setting it up. And then after that, we can go back and add dynamic pages for home and about us as well. But let's start with our team. So let's create a data type in Strapi called team members. And then this our team page, this can show a list of all team members, right? And then you can click on an individual one uh, to visit just their single individual uh, like detail uh, URL for just that one team member. So let's set that up on the back end. So back in Strapi, uh, the Strapi slash admin page, this left-hand menu is how you accomplish most things in Strapi. And we're interested in this fourth icon, or I guess if you count the top Strapi icon, this fifth icon, but essentially just the one that says content type builder. Go ahead and click on that. Uh, we can click skip the tour and you can close this rating system. All right, so there are a few different types of data types that we can create. There's collection types, single types, components. Right now, we're interested in a collection type. So we're going to create a collection called team members. Uh, but, you know, you could make another collection called like blog posts or help articles or unicorns or pizzas, right? There, there's no limit to what you want to create. But I just want to create a collection called team members. So I would just use this create new collection type link. Let's give it a display name of team members. All right, that's all we need for now. We can click continue. Whoops, so this is actually letting me know that I guess the display name should be singular. So like just make the display name team member and then that way it can automatically, you know, have this one be singular and have this one be plural. Cool, so just team member, let's click continue. All right, and now we just add all of the different fields or properties that we want this data type to have. So, I, for example, I want each team member to have a name. I want each team member to have a description. I want each one to have a photograph. I want each one to have a slug, like a you know text name for the URL pattern. Uh, so now we just start adding out the different fields. Let's start with their name, the name of each team member. So that would be you know, for that field type, it would just be a text field. So I'll click text. 
we need to give this text field a name or label. Uh, so it's just like the team member's name. So we'll just go with name. Now you could make this uppercase N name or lowercase N name, but e again, either one would work. But just so you and I working through this tutorial are on the same page, why don't we actually go with lowercase name, uh, just so we're typing in the same values when we're actually trying to retrieve this data, you know, five or 10 minutes down the road. So lowercase name, cool. Let's use short text. And then if you click onto advanced settings, I'm gonna click um, this checkbox for required field. So you're not able to leave you know, the name value empty, you must provide a value. Cool. Let's go ahead and click add another field down here. Uh, why don't we add like a small description? So I'll click on text again, only for this one. So let's call it like a uh, description for the label or the name, the field name. Let's go with long text. Perfect. It even says best for descriptions or biography. Cool. Let's also have that be required. So I'll click in advance, click required. Let's click add another field. Uh, let's add a photograph. So if you scroll down, there's an option called media. Let's go ahead and set that up. Under basic settings, let's call it just photo. We don't need to get creative with this field name. Uh, instead of uploading multiple files, I'm going to set it to single. Like you're only allowed to upload a single photo. Best for avatar or profile pictures. Cool. Let's click on advanced settings. I don't want video or audio, I only want images. So I'll make sure that's the only one that's checked. And then I'll also go ahead and make that a required field. That's totally up to you, but this is what I want. Okay, and then let's add another field. Let's add a slug. So a slug would be like, uh, even if the team member's name was like Meows a lot the third with spaces and capital letters, a slug is a URL friendly, you know, like shortened version of the text. So in Strapi, there's this great data type called a UID down here. UID, you can click that. Let's go under basic settings. So its name should just be, and again, I'm making this up, but let's call it like slug. And then the attached field is the name. So it can pre-populate the slug for you based on what you're choosing for their name. Uh, that would be their you know, URL pattern, perfect. Let's click on advanced settings. This absolutely should be required. Cool, now we can add more fields down the road if we forgot something, but for now, let's go ahead and click finish. And then you do need to be sure to click save. If you don't click save, it will not, you know, everything we just did will be forgotten. So absolutely click save. That's gonna restart your Strapi development server. It's really quick, it's already done. Now we just have one more step before we can practice fetching some of this data, or I should say before we enter a few items. Now before we go pretend that we're the client uh, or the non-developer a programmer and actually go create a few team members, I wanna first show you how to make sure that our data will be available to Next.js. So before we move on, this is very important. Go into settings, so this icon down here, scroll down to the very bottom, and under users and permissions plugin, we're looking for roles, go ahead and click on roles, and then we wanna edit this public role, so you can click on this icon right here, Okay, and then down here under permissions, we're interested in team member. That's the custom data type we just created. And you absolutely want to be sure to check find and find one. This way you don't need an API token or an application password or any sort of credentials to query for this data, right? It's not private data. It's not sensitive data. But we just want to make it available. Now, notice we're not letting the public create or delete but just read and find, that's fine. So find and find one, cool. You can go ahead and click save up in the top right, perfect. Now with that selected, that's gonna let you know your API URL. We can circle back to this screen to grab that in just a moment. The point is though, is we have now set up the proper permissions. Uh, we clicked save, so now let's go have some fun. In the left-hand sidebar, we want to use this icon. So when you hover over it, it says content manager. Go ahead and click on that. And let's pretend we're a non-developer, non-programmer that's you know contributing content to the website. So you can just click this button to create a new entry, a new team member, and let's just fill this out. So I'll say the first team member's name is Meows a lot. And I'll just write a short description. Um, this is the most friendly cat that you will ever meet. Meows a lot loves tuna and carrots. Cool, now for the slug field, if you click this icon, that's gonna automatically regenerate it based on the name. So you can see it took out uh, the capital M and made it lowercase m. And if you made the name like a value that 
has spaces, it will, auto and I click this again, it'll automatically make it sort of URL friendly or URL safe. Now, I don't actually want that. I just want meows a lot. So I'll click this icon again. Cool. Let's go ahead and add a photo. If you don't have any photos laying around on your computer's hard drive, that's okay. You can visit unsplash.com and then just search for what, you know, dog or cat uh, for some example photos. But I have some lying around. So uh, just click on this plus symbol for photo and strappy. Click add more assets. Click browse files in my downloads folder. You can just pick any, you know, I'll choose this cat photo. Cool. Click upload one asset to the library. Click finish. Now, this is important to point out. So you could click save to save your progress, but that won't actually make this data like officially finished or available or published. So you do need to be sure to choose publish. Cool. Let's go create maybe like two more. So I'll just click team member in this sidebar. Click create new entry. Let me set one up for barks a lot. Click the slug icon. Say uh, this is a truly great dog. Everyone that meets barks a lot is a huge fan. Let's go ahead and add a photo of a dog really quick. All right, it looks good. Click finish, click publish. All right, if you wanted to, you could add more animals or more team members. You just click team member, click create new entry, uh, but I don't wanna waste any more time. So if I create any more, I'll do it off camera. Now the question becomes, how can we use this data uh, from within Next.js. So our immediate goal right now is on the Our Team page. How do we list all team members, right? And then we would wanna create a link for each one. So when you click on that one, it takes you to a URL just for that one team member. So how do we load all team members here? Well, if you go back into Strapi, I think the easiest way to find your API URL is to click on Settings and then go down to user permissions, just that screen that we were already on the roles and then click public, click on team member. And we want the find, not find one, but specifically find. If you hover over it and click on that little settings icon, that's gonna show you the API URL right here. So I would just select this into your clipboard and let's get ready to paste it. So in a new tab, visit localhost colon 1337, right? That's the strappy port number that, you know, that runs on localhost, but then it's slash and then just paste in your clipboard. You can see I actually have too many forward slashes there, but it's just the localhost and the port number and then slash API slash team members. Go ahead and press enter. Cool. And there's the raw JSON. So this has the information for meows a lot and barks a lot. I actually prefer to view raw JSON in Firefox instead of Chrome. Uh, because in Firefox, you can, let me zoom in a little bit here for you. Firefox actually formats uh, the data instead of just looking like plain text. So uh, that endpoint is going to give us, you know, two properties and inside of data, it's just an array. So this first item is meows a lot and this item is barks a lot. Cool. Now let's practice fetching the JSON that lives at this URL from within our next JS application. This is where we connect the dots. So back in VS Code for our project, you know, our front end, um, let's just go into app and then our team and go into page.jsx. All right, up at the very top, even outside the default function that we're exporting, uh, let's create a new function. Let's call it an async function. And you could name it anything, but let's call it like get all team members, parentheses, curly brackets. And the job of this function is just going to be to fetch that data and return it. So I would say like, uh, you know, const members promise equals await fetch and then quotes and then just go back to your browser where we were fetch uh, the URL that has that JSON, the entire URL, right? Including localhost, blah, blah, blah. Just paste that into your, excuse me, copy that into your clipboard. And then in the fetch quotes, just paste it in. All right. On the next line, let's say. Uh, const members equals await that members promise and then at the end of it call json okay and then at the very end let's just say return members dot data if you're wondering why i'm saying dot data well if you look at the data that it returns it has two properties data and meta we don't need meta we're just interested i mean you might need meta if you wanted some of these details but in our case we just want the actual collection the data 
Cool. So now down in our component, uh, we can just leverage this function. So inside of our uh, function called page, but before we return anything, let's just say uh, const maybe members equals and then just await and then just call get all team members parentheses. And if we're going to use await in this function, we need to, you know, right before the word function here, say async. Cool. But now we have this, you know, array called members. Now we can loop through that uh, down in our content here. Down in our JSX, why don't we leave the overall wrapper div? Uh, let's change the heading level one to say like our team. And then let's get rid of the paragraph. And then let's have a wrapper div for all of our team members. And then inside that div, let's start looping through our collection. So here's what I would do. Curly brackets for something dynamic. Uh, members, that's the array that we're trying to loop through. So I would just use every array has access to the map method. So map, parentheses to call that. In these parentheses, we give map a function. Let's give it an arrow function. So let's call each singular instance just singular member and then arrow symbol and then curly brackets. Inside, you know, between those curly brackets, let's drop down. And then we're just going to return a new bit of JSX. For now, in between those, you can drop down. You're free to have multiple lines. Eventually, we'll have each one be a link. But for now, let's just have each one be a div. And inside it, let's have curly brackets. And let's just show their name. So it would be member dot name. All right, let's save this and see what that gets us. So back on our website, cool. Well, not cool in terms of CSS layout that this, you know, sort of shrunk wrap again. This is not really a tutorial about CSS, uh, but cool that there's our list of team members, meows a lot and barks a lot. A bit later on, we can set up some nicely styled cards so that like each animal or each team member has like a card with their photograph, their description that you can click on as a link. And then it'll take you to a URL for just that one animal. Uh, but before we worry about styling and all those details, Let's first just worry about turning these into links. So here's what I would do. Let's still have each member return an overall div uh, because in JSX, uh, each little bit of JSX can only have one overall container, container element. So that div can be our one top level element, but inside that div, uh, let's just wrap the member's name inside of a uppercase link, uh, you know, Next.js link component. So be sure to move the ending tag after that. Cool. And then for the href, uh, let's set that to, not quotes, my bad. It would be curly brackets. And because I want to do something dynamic, let's actually use back ticks inside of the curly brackets. And essentially it would be like slash our team slash, you know, and then the dynamic part. Uh, so this would be their slug. So instead of ABC, it would be dollar sign curly brackets and then just member dot slug. Let's give this a save. So if we, ref uh, well, we don't need to refresh. Whoops, link is not defined. Uh, you just go up to the very top of your file and say import link from quotes next slash link. Cool. So when I hover over meows a lot, now if I click this, we're gonna get a 404 error as to be, as I would expect, but awesome. That's the exact URL pattern I was hoping for, right? You can go back, you can click on barks a lot. Perfect. So now the question becomes, how do we set up uh, in Next.js this URL pattern? Like, how do we tell Next.js that uh, what it should do when it visits this URL pattern? Like, how do we tell it, hey, use this slug and look on the Strapi API for a team member where the slug property matches, you know, this value just for this one team member? So in Next.js, uh, the URL routing system is actually actually just folder and file based. So check this out. Inside of the Our Team folder, we already have page.jsx, but here's what we're going to do. Create a subfolder inside of the Our Team folder. So new folder on Our Team. And we need to give it names uh, that start and end with square brackets. So opening square bracket, and then we're going to type something closing square bracket. Now you could name it anything. You could name it like name or type or species or pizza or unicorn, but I'm going to call it slug, right? Because that's what that part of the URL parameter, you know, just, just to have it make sense. Like that's what it is. It's a slug. Typically you might also see this as like ID. If you were going to look up the item by its ID number or something like that, but let's just call it slug square brackets. All right. And then inside of that folder, so inside the slug folder, we're going to have a file called 
you might have guessed it, page.jsx. All right, in this brand new empty folder, let's say export default function. Uh, let's call it like uppercase page, parentheses, curly brackets. In the body of the function, let's return parentheses and then we're gonna have a bit of JSX. Let's just have a div. And for now, just to prove that this is working, let's either output like meows a lot or barks a lot, like the dynamic name uh, for which URL you visited. I just wanna show you how to access this URL parameter, this part of the URL pattern. So uh, when we're creating our function here in these parentheses, uh, let's have curly brackets and we're destructuring for something and we're calling it params, but like URL parameters. And then we can access that. So like in the div, let's output curly brackets and just say params.slug, right? Because that's what we named that part of the URL pattern. So if we save that and we go back I mean, cool, there it is, barks a lot. But if you go to the meows a lot page, perfect. Now, our job is actually not done here. Uh, so all this means is that we have access. We can access the currently requested pet uh, from you know, params.slug. But now we would need to go write a query that actually goes off to the Strapi API and fetches the data for just that one team member. So let's do that right now. Above that default function, I'd probably say like, async function and you could name this anything i'm just going to make up a name of like fetch uh team member like singular just fetch one parentheses curly brackets and then inside our actual main function here let's say like const member equals await fetch team member just call that function and then if we're going to use await here we would want to put async right here Cool, and then instead of params.slug, let's say like uh, member.name here. Now this will error out if we save currently because we haven't written any code to power this variable in this function, uh, but let's do that right now. So in this fetch team member function, in order to save a bit of typing, let's actually go back into our our team page.jsx uh, because I don't wanna have to retype in, you know, this promise and this await. So I would just select these two lines, uh, the line where we have await fetch in the URL, and then the line where we say const members equals. So I would just copy those two lines, paste them in. Let's change this to singular, right? Like const member equals. All right, but the only problem is this URL is going to return all team members, and we want to return only the one team member based on params.slug. Now in Strapi, you can really fine tune what you're returning by adding on different URL parameters or you know, building out a query string on the end of this URL. But instead of typing out a, a really long string of text here at the very end of here manually, just to keep our code organized, why don't we have a line right above that and call it like const our query equals, and for now just put quotes. Uh, but now we can build out our own, you know, really finely tuned query string and then just append that on uh, to this end of this string. Cool. Now, if you dig through the Strapi documentation, they'll let you know that when you're going to be doing custom queries like this, you're probably going to want to use the NPM package called QS. So here's what I would do. Uh, in your command line, you can press Control or Command J. Let's stop the current task. Yeah, so Control C to stop it. And then say NPM install QS. It stands for query string. Uh, so go ahead and install that. And then let's just start up our project again with npm run dev. Cool. So up at the very top of this file, let's import. So import QS from quotes QS. All right. And now we can build out our custom query. So let's have it equal. And instead of quotes, let's have it say uh, QS dot stringify parentheses to call that. And then we're going to give it an object. For now, let's just start with filters, and I'm not making this up, it needs to be filters. Give that an object and say that slug should be, you know, colon. And then this would be either like, you know, quotes, meows a lot or barks a lot, but we don't wanna hard code it to a value like that. Let's, so let's just say slug colon slug, right? And then down here when we're actually calling this function of fetch team member, uh, let's give it, a so down here, a dynamic value of params dot slug so again that would be meows a lot or barks a lot or purrs loud cool all right now let's just actually use this query string uh, and let's actually just append it to the end of this url 
So I would change this, instead of being wrapped in quotes, let's wrap it in back ticks at the start and at the end. And now, uh, at the end here, after the word members, we can say uh, question mark and then dollar sign curly brackets and then just say our query. Cool. So now we're going to have this one singular member and then we do want to be sure uh, to return that. So let's say like return singular member and then look inside it for data, square brackets, and just the first item in the array. Let's give that a save and see if we run into any errors. Ah, so we see slug is not defined. I think I just forgot to include that in our function. Yep, so on line three, fetch team member. Uh, let's have a parameter and name it slug uh, so that this can actually find slug here. So that's what that was referencing, this incoming parameter. Let's give that a save. Cool, uppercase meows a lot. So now in that template down here, you could, you could also say like, you know, heading level three and then have like member dot description. Cool, this is the most friendly cat, blah, blah, blah. Nice, you could go back and check out barks a lot. Excellent. At this point, our URL scheme is looking good. We have our list with all of them. We have an individual, you know, singular URL. Now let's have some fun. Let's go to our team and let's actually build out like the two column layout, uh, you know, with the photograph, the name, the description, the clickable link card that actually looks good. Then after that, I want to show you how on the individual screen for a team member, we're going to set up like more advanced actual body content. Uh, so we'll set up like custom testimonial content or spoiler content where you can click a button to reveal more text. We'll also set up like a fun looking banner area with the name and the, the background image of the pet, so on and so forth. But let's start with the, the cool uh, link cards that you click on on this Our Team page. I want to display the photo for each team member. So let's start with the photo. Uh, currently, if you look at the API endpoint, uh, that we're fetching the data from, it does not contain the photograph. So again, here it is in Firefox, it's a bit easier to see. So like this first item is a pet. Yes, we see name and description and slug, but we do not see the photo uh, field. However, if at the end of the address, we add on question mark and then populate equals asterisk to sort of populate everything, we visit that, Awesome, now we see that it does contain uh, a photo object with everything that we could need. Cool, so let's just be sure to use that um, if we go into our team and then not in slug, but just the page that has all the pets. Let's just be sure to adjust our URL here. So after members, again, it's question mark populate equals asterisk, cool. At this point, uh, now on this page, Let's start building out uh, the layout uh, with two uh, pet cards per row. So here's what I would do. First of all, let's have our heading level one look like a heading. So I'll give it class name of maybe like text dash four XL uh, margin bottom six. Let's give it a bold font. Let's say text gray 700. Cool. That looks better. Uh, now let's set this up uh, to be a two column grid area. So here's what I would do. On this div that houses everything we're looping through, I would just say, you know, class name, uh, grid, grid calls to, and then give them a gap, uh, you know, in between the, the items. Okay, so there's our two columns. And now I want each link that you click on, I want it to have two columns. So I want like the photo on the left column, and then I want their name and description in the right hand column. So here's what I would do. When we're looping through our collection, I just realized we actually don't need this wrapper div, so we can get rid of that. We can just return the link itself as the top level element. Now in your command line, you will see a warning uh, that when you're looping through a collection, each top level element should have its unique key prop. And this is for performance reasons in React. So to fix that, on the link uh, component, we can just say key equals curly brackets. And then let's just say member.id. That is a unique value for each item. Cool. Now inside of that link, let's have two columns. So in other words, instead of inside this content of just curly brackets member name, uh, in between the opening and closing link tags, I drop down. And now I would spell out two columns. The first column can actually just be our image element uh, for the pet. And then the second column can be a div. Inside that second column, let's have a paragraph 
uh, with their name. And then after that, maybe a paragraph with their description. So member dot description. Okay, and then let's fill in the image to actually have a source. So let's say source equals curly brackets. Let's use back ticks and then let's say HTTP colon slash slash local host colon 1337. And then anything beyond that, we want to be dynamic for the specific pet. So I would say dollar sign curly brackets and then just member.photo.formats.medium.url. Let's give that a save and see if that's pulling in the content. Cool. So we still want to set up like, so this should be a two column layout with the photo taking up this portion and then the name and description taking up this portion. But we can see all the data is pulling in successfully. Now let's set up that uh, card two column layout. So I would make that happen by giving classes to the overall link element. So I would say class name, let's say grid, grid calls. And now I don't just want to say two because that would be two equal width columns. I want the photo column to be, you know, narrower than the main column. So what you can do is give it an arbitrary value with square brackets. And let's say the first column should be 140 pixels. And then the second column should take up any and all remaining space. Cool. Let's also give it BG white. Let's give it a bit of a shadow. Let's say that it should use uh, large rounded corners. Uh, let's say overflow hidden so that the rounded corners are respected by the image. Let's save that and see what that gets us. Cool, we're almost there. So now I would just want to tell the image to sort of expand to take up the full height and sort of crop itself so that the aspect ratio doesn't get messed up. So here's what I would do. I would tell the overall link element that we're already on to use relative positioning. And that way we can tell our image. So I would just give it a few class names or not plural, just class name equals. I would tell it to use absolute positioning and then tell it to be inset zero. So that's basically like top zero, bottom zero, left zero, right zero. And then I would also say height full width full. Uh, but I don't want the aspect ratio. So essentially I'm telling it to take up all of the width and height available, but I, want, I don't want the aspect ratio to look odd. So then you can say object dash cover. Save that and see what that gets us. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, I haven't had enough coffee today. So <laughs> that's taking up the full uh, link because we need, let me explain exactly what's going on here. We told our grid container that the first item should be 140 pixels wide, but then our first item that should receive that is using absolute positioning. So what I would do is just wrap our image inside a div like this. I would have an, a wrapper div and then just move your image to live inside that div. This way, uh, this div will receive that first column width and then we can tell it to uh, have class name uh, relative and that way the image can be the full size, you know, of its, it's only going to be 140 pixels wide. So if we save that, awesome. Let's add a bit of padding to this area and just improve the text styling a bit. So down here, I would give this maybe like padding four and let's improve uh, the name. So this would be like class name, text, extra large, text, gray, 600 font, bold change this description, maybe like text dash small, text gray 500, uh, letting six. Let's give that a save. Looking good. Let's add some fun hover styles so that if you hover anywhere on top of this link card, maybe the image sort of zooms in and rotates and maybe we change uh, the color of the headline a bit. So here's what I would do. The first thing is I would want to give a class uh, to the overall container, the link element, because if you hover over anything inside of it, I want this hover effect to take place. So on that link element, you just give it a class of group, and now this makes uh, hover effects very easy. So for example, uh, down on the name text, not just when it gets hovered, but when the link card as a whole gets hovered. So to do that, you can say group dash hover colon, and then let's just change, you know, text, gray, bump it up to like 700. So now when you hover over, it's very subtle in the video, but you'll see it on your example. Uh, the name gets a bit darker. Let's set it up so the image sort of zooms in and rotates when you hover over the card. So I would just give the image element 
uh, hover colon, excuse me, group hover colon, and I would just bump up the scale a bit. So scale maybe like 125%. Let's say group hover colon, maybe like rotate dash 12. Let's give that a save. Cool. Uh, that's almost what I want. I would want it to not overflow the column though. So I would just find that wrapper div that we had, this one, and just tell it to be overflow hidden. Cool. I also don't want it to just snap into place. I want it to sort of transition or animate. So on the image element, I would just say transition and then duration 300. Cool. I think that looks nice. I might add a subtle gradient. Uh, so when you hover over the card, maybe like uh, a background gradient right about here. So to do that on the parent link element, I would just give it a few extra classes of like hover colon BG gradient to right from white to amber 50. Let's give that a save. Cool, it's very subtle, uh, but there you can see sort of an amber or yellow background gradient. At this point, let's change gears and now let's actually click on one of these cards and let's work on the content and layout that appears for an individual team member. So yes, we already have the description, but that's a really short description and that's designed for this overall listing uh, page. When you actually click onto a pet screen, you could imagine you want like a rich text, almost like a Word document amount of text, right? Like different paragraphs and headings and Let's take it a step further than that though. In addition to like multiple paragraphs, a separate field for that, let's also have the ability to mix in like a testimonial block in the middle of your long content or like a spoiler block in the middle of your long content. So you could imagine maybe like one paragraph, two paragraphs, and then a testimonial and then another paragraph. Cool. Let me show you how you could set something like that up in Strapi. So back in the admin dashboard, let's go into content type builder. So again, this icon in the sidebar. And if you didn't want custom things like testimonials or spoilers, and you just wanted rich text, uh, sort of like a Word doc editor, you could just go into team member and click add another field to this collection type, and then just choose this option, rich text blocks. However, I want to take it one step further. I want an area, like if I pretend I'm editing meows a lot, I want an area down here uh, where I can click a plus symbol and then I get to choose, do I want a rich text editor, do I want a testimonial, do I want a spoiler? And again, you could create as many different custom components as you wanted to. You could have like an image slider or a frequently asked questions or, I mean, the sky is the limit. So what if you wanted to mix and match and then be able to like have your content contributors like drag and drop and rearrange uh, the rich text and the testimonials. Uh, I think that's when the power of the Strappy editor really comes to the surface and shines. So what we're going to do is go back into content type builder. And before we edit the content type of team member, let's go create a, custom, uh, a few custom components. So right here, you can click create new component. And why don't we call this one like testimonial? The icon doesn't matter, you can choose any one you want. Okay, for the category, I would just create a new category and call it like features. And just to be safe here, I'm gonna make that a lowercase f for features and I'll make this a lowercase t for testimonial. Okay, and then I'll go ahead and click continue. I'm going to say that a testimonial should be made up of three fields. It should have uh, a photograph of the person saying the quote or the testimonial. It should have a text field for the name of the quote author. And then it should have another text field for the actual quote, like the testimonial that they're saying. So let's create one text field. Let's call this like author name. And let's add another field. Uh, it'll be a text field. Let's have it be like, maybe just quote. And that can be long text, best for descriptions. And then let's add one more field. And this would be a photograph of the person saying the quote or testimonial. So I'd click on media. I would just give this field an, a name of photo. I'd set it to single media. I'll click on advanced and I'll undo video and audio, just image. Cool. Now I'll click finish. So this looks good for me. I'm going to click the top right save. Perfect. And then while we're at it, let's go create one more component type. 
So down here, create new component, and I'm gonna call it a spoiler. Again, you can click any icon you want, and then let's set that to the features category. Let's click continue. Uh, this really only needs, I think, two fields, right? So let's have one text field, and this can be called like clickable text. So for example, you might say like, show the weather or show the ending of the movie, right? Just the spoiler text, the preview text essentially that you're clicking on. Okay, let's add one more field and then it would be a text field and I would call this like actual spoiler and that can be long text. Cool, I'll click finish, I'll click save. All right, so we have our two custom components of spoiler and testimonial. Let's actually create one more new component but it's just gonna be a single field. So it's gonna be very quick. So you can click create new component and I'm just going to call this rich text. We can give it a category of features. Go ahead and click continue. And then we don't need to set up like multiple fields. It can literally just have a single field of the rich text type. So we can click that. Let's give it a name of like content and then click finish. And go ahead and click save in the top right. All right, let me explain what's going on here now. Now we have our three options that we want content authors to be able to choose from uh, for sort of the main uh, body content area of a team member, right? They can choose between adding rich text, adding a spoiler, or adding a testimonial. Let me show you how you put this all together. In this same content type builder screen, let's click on team member, uh, right? That's what has name, description, photo, slug, and we're just gonna add one more field. So you can click add another field. But if you scroll down to the very bottom, we're interested in this option. It's called dynamic zone. Go ahead and click that. And let's just give it a name maybe of like body content. And then you click add components to the zone. And we're gonna click use an existing component. And then you just check all the check boxes that you want. So I want all of my features or you could just you know select the ones you want, but we want all three of them. Testimonial, spoiler, and rich text. And then you can click finish. Go ahead and click save in the top right. And now check this out. Watch how cool this is. If we go edit, maybe like go into content manager and edit meows a lot. Down here we see add a component to body content. And when you click on that, you get to choose. Do you want to add, you know, rich text, testimonial or spoiler? So maybe let's start with rich text. And then you can click into that and you get sort of this rich text experience. So I'll just grab some lorem ipsum from Wikipedia. Uh, but the idea is like, imagine you have like a paragraph and then another paragraph and then uh, maybe like a heading level two that says an example heading and then another paragraph. Cool. And then like imagine you add another component and then you add uh, a spoiler. So you can click on that. Say the clickable text says show secret info and then the actual spoiler. You can just paste in some lorem ipsum. And then imagine someone wants to add in like more rich text. You click on that, maybe just paste in another paragraph. Uh, maybe have a heading level three, an example H3, uh, maybe another paragraph. And then imagine they want to add a, a, te a testimonial. So you click the add component button, click testimonial. Uh, let's just say like author name is, I'll put in my own name. I'll say uh, meows a lot is the greatest cat you really should meet this cat. And then I'll use this field to add in a photo of myself. Go ahead and upload that asset, click finish. Now the idea is that you, you're free to, like if I collapse these, uh, the idea is that you you can drag and drop them to reorder them, right? So you can use this icon to like, maybe I want the testimonial to sit up here. Cool. So the idea though is that you could have created, you know, 20 different component types to fit whatever needs your website has instead of testimonial and spoiler. Uh, but rich text is probably a safe bet, but you get the idea. It's up to you. The sky is the limit. Anyways, let's go ahead and publish this. And now our task is to make sure that we're actually fetching that data on this detail screen and that we know how to display it because now we need to do completely different things depending on um, like, is it a piece of rich text? Is it a piece of testimonial data? Is it a piece of spoiler data? There's a, a little bit of logic there now. So how are we going to do this? I think our first step should be to pay attention to the data we're actually getting uh, for this team member. Let me explain. Let's log to the console. So in our, uh, 
our slug page.jsx page file for an individual team member. So this file, right, where currently all we have is just a div uh, with the name and description. Let's log this to the console. So after we fetch the member, let's just say console.log member, singular member. Let's save that and then look in your console. And then in order to see that, just make sure you're on an individual team member screen. You can click refresh. That should actually display it in VS Code's terminal. All right. What I'm trying to show you is that, uh, so for example, like here is the object. It does not contain their photo, and it also does not contain their new uh, body content field. Now, there is a bit of caching going on in Next.js, so you could hold the shift key on your keyboard and then click the refresh icon. But you can see that's still not giving us body content or photo. So the solution to this, what I'm trying to get at here, you can hide your co uh, command line for now, is we need to go up into our query where we're building our own custom uh, like URL parameter or query string, and we need to spell out things a bit more explicitly. So we have filters, but we can say after that, you can say comma, and then we're going to say populate colon curly brackets, and now we're going to do a few things. So for the photo property, let's tell that to be asterisk. Just give us everything related to the photo, comma. Uh, but then we need to go into body content. That was our dynamic zone field. Uh, say curly brackets, and then on colon curly brackets. And now I just want to sort of opt in to each uh, component type. So the first one we'll say is like features dot rich text colon curly brackets, this would be populate colon just quotes asterisk, and then comma, we want quotes features dot spoiler, colon curly brackets populate asterisk, comma at the end of that, and then do the same thing for testimonial. So features dot testimonial colon curly brackets populate colon, just quotes, asterisk. Let's give this a save and now look at the command line and see what we're getting. Uh, so it looks like I'm running into an error here. Off camera, I just diagnosed the problem and here's what's going on. So I named this field uh, rich text with like, you know, uh, no dashes in between, just an uppercase letter for text. Strappy automatically converts that syntax to instead be, uh, you know, all lowercase with dashes in between. So if you used a similar naming pattern to me, just be very aware of that. Strappy is going to rename your fields to all lowercase with dashes like this. If we save that though, and now check the console, cool. So we don't have an error anymore. And now let's take a look at the data that's going, here, going on here. We've got body content, it's an array. And as you might've guessed, each item in that array is either you know, of the component type of rich text, testimonial, or spoiler. And they all have the exact properties you would need. Like, so testimonial has author name, quote text, and then a photo object. Spoiler has clickable text, actual spoiler. Rich text is interesting. So it contains an array, and then each block inside of that is like of the type of paragraph or heading level two or heading level three. So now it's just as simple as within our JSX, within React, we need to sort of loop through this body content array and do the appropriate thing depending on the type it is. Is it text, is it testimonial, or is it spoiler? So here's what I would do. Let's scroll down and find our JSX. And below this existing content, uh, but still within our overall single wrapping div, remember in JSX you can only have one top level element. And just a JSX tip, if you didn't for some reason want to add like an, an unnecessary div, you can use this syntax just for one single container. This is called a React fragment. It won't add an unnecessary like unsemantic element to your markup, but then you still just have that one single top level container. Cool. In my case, I'm going to leave it as a div because I'm probably going to want to add some Tailwind classes to it. But for now, down here, here's what we're going to do for the body content. Let's have a wrapper div just for the body content, and then let's go into curly brackets, and we know that it's under member, and then if you look inside that, it's body content. Now that's an array. So let's use map to sort of loop through that array. And then let's use an arrow function, so parentheses, I'm gonna say item, comma, 
index and then arrow symbol. And then we're just going to call a function. Uh, this function doesn't exist yet. We can create it in five seconds from now. But why don't we have a function called like our renderer? You could name it anything. You could name it pizza. Uh, but parentheses to call it and then pass it item comma index. Cool. Now let's go create a function with this name. So maybe right up here, uh, right above the export line, we can just say function our renderer parentheses curly brackets. In the parentheses, let's have item comma index. And now let's just write a couple of if statements. You could also use a switch uh, switch case syntax, but let's just say like if parentheses curly brackets for the first condition. Let's say like if item dot underscore underscore component triple equal signs features dot testimonial uh, and for now we can set this up to be more organized later but for now let's just return a paragraph that says this is a testimonial okay and then I would just duplicate this uh, for if it is features dot spoiler and say this is a spoiler and then you guessed it, if it's rich text, that would just, so if this is rich dash text, say this is rich text. Let's give that a save. And if we go check out the front end, awesome. So remember from Meow's lot, we had like rich text, testimonial, spoiler, rich text. If you go to Barks a lot, I don't think there's any body content. So you get the idea. So now instead of just these placeholders, let's actually display something that looks like a testimonial and uses that real data, that uses the real spoiler data, that uses the real rich text data. Let's start with rich text. So with rich text, um, it contains an array of elements like it could be a paragraph, it could be a heading level three. And technically you could write your own React code to output the appropriate element based on uh, that content. But Strappy has already done that hard work for us. So let me show you what we're gonna do here. Uh, open up your command line and type control C to stop that task. And we're going to install a package. Say npm install at symbol Strappy slash, and it's called blocks dash react dash renderer. And then the space, let's also include Husky. This package seems to depend on Husky and I've had it fail without this. So let's go ahead and press enter. All right, then we can start things up again with npm run dev, cool. Now up at the very top of our file, let's be sure to import that. So we can say import curly brackets uh, blocks renderer from, and then it's quotes at symbol strappy and VS Code Autocomplete has got us covered, cool. So now let me show you how easy it is to use this. Uh, if we just go back down into our our renderer, if the component type is rich text, instead of this paragraph, we can just return a blocks renderer self-closing element or component and just give it content. So I'm not making up this prop name, it needs to be just content, uh, but you say equals curly brackets and then it's just item dot content. Let's give that a save, go to the front end. You will need to perform a manual refresh or to clear the cache, you can hold shift and hit the reload icon, uh, but very cool. Now the downside here is that because we're using Tailwind, uh, this doesn't look like a heading level three. And you know, there's no spacing around the paragraph, so on and so forth. So uh, for the next minute or two, this has nothing to do with Next or Strappy, uh, but let me show you how in Tailwind, you can get some really nice defaults for paragraphs, unordered list, and you know, H1 through H6. So all we do is go into our command line. Let's stop the current task. We need to install a package from NPM. We're just gonna say NPM install, and it's at symbol tailwind CSS slash and it's just named typography. Go ahead and press enter. We can start our task up again, npm run dev, and let's go use it. So really all we need to do is go into our tailwind config.js file, and down here in the empty plugins array, well, in those square brackets, just say require, parentheses quotes, at symbol tailwind, and then you can see VS Code autocomplete is kicking in, cool. So if we save that, we're one step away. Now just go back into our HTML or you know our JSX and this wrapper div that houses our you know our body content all you have to do is give it a class so class name of prose 
So this Tailwind plugin, anytime you use pros, then any elements nested inside it have great defaults, like paragraphs, lists, headings. If we save that and perform a hard refresh, cool. I mean, immediately, now our paragraphs look like paragraphs, our heading looks like a heading, if you had a list, so on and so forth. There's an example H3, awesome. I'd probably go ahead and in addition to pros, I'd also say uh, max W none, so that way it doesn't have a max width, cool. So that takes care of rich text. Now let's take care of our testimonial and spoiler. So what's really cool here is you could uh, spell those components out right here, but I think it would be a lot of fun to create a separate organized file. You know, we already have this folder named components. So here's what I'm gonna do. In components, let's create a new file. Let's name it like spoiler.jsx. And then, you know, export default function, spoiler parentheses, curly brackets. Uh, for now, in the body of the function, let's just return a bit of JSX, uh, just a div and say, spoiler, let's give that a save. And then let's do the same thing. So in components, let's create a new file for testimonial. So testimonial.jsx, again, just export default function, testimonial, parentheses, curly brackets, just return a div and say, testimonial. Cool, now we can go back into our individual slug and up at the top, just import those. So import uh, spoiler from. And now earlier in this lesson, I promised I would show you a nice way uh, to avoid having to like go up a bunch of folders, right? Because currently we'd have to go up out of the slug folder, up out of our team, up out of app. You'd have to go up three levels and then go into components. Uh, so that would absolutely work, but if you want to have a cleaner code up here, let me show you what you can do. In the root of our project folder, so just, you know, in the, the root, say new file, and name it jsconfig, and I'm not making this name up, it needs to be exactly jsconfig.json. In that new file, have an object with a property of compiler options, colon object, say paths, colon object, quotes, and then it's at symbol slash asterisk colon, and then the value is square brackets, quote dot slash asterisk. So if you save that, and then go back into our slug file that we're working on, now, check it out, we don't have to go up three folders, you can just say at symbol for sort of uh, the root of your project. So it's more of like an absolute path, it's a lot cleaner. Now you can just say, you know, components, spoiler. We can do the same thing. We can import testimonial from, uh, just at symbol components, uh, testimonial. Cool, so now we can use those down here. So in our renderer, if the component is testimonial, let's do this, let's just return uh, testimonial, self-closing, and then this would be, you know, self-closing spoiler. You can give that a save. Looks like we're running into an error. I might just try uh, stopping my server and starting it up again. Maybe with the new JS config file, you need to actually restart your server. Cool, so that fixed it. So there we see testimonial, spoiler, awesome. So now we have these really organized files. Uh, now let's just start building the testimonial component. So back in our slug file, when we're calling the testimonial component, uh, let's give it a prop, let's just call it like data equals, and then just give it uh, the item. So that way we can actually access the dynamic values, right? So now we can save that, go into our testimonial component, be sure to include props here uh, in the opening parentheses. Cool, down here, let's once again have parentheses, uh, just a wrapper div. Inside the div, let's have a paragraph, and then to actually display the text, it would just be props dot and we named it data, and then inside that it would be, uh, remember in Strapi we named it quote. So if you save that, there's the quote, Meowzalot is the greatest cat, you should really meet this cat. Now let's add um, both the author name and then the author photo, but let's also add a little bit of styling so it looks good. So on this overall div, let's say class name equals BG Gray 200, rounded edges, let's actually make those large rounded edges. Let's give it vertical padding, uh, let's give it horizontal padding. Let's bump up the padding bottom. Uh, let's say that it's not prose. Uh, that way it doesn't automatically style the paragraphs and headings. Let's give it a ton of bottom margin. 
Uh, let's set it to relative positioning. Let's set the text to center. Let's style the actual quote text itself. So it would have class name of text dash 2XL, italic, text gray 600. And then you could also hard code like a quote symbol at the beginning and a quote symbol at the end to look like a quote. And then below that paragraph, let's have a div. And this can contain the author name and the author photograph. So in the div, let's first just have an image. And let's say source equals, and let's use back ticks and say HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 1337, and then something dynamic, so dollar sign curly brackets. Let's say props.data.authorphoto.formats.medium.url. Let's also give this image element an alt attribute, and that can just be props.data.authorName. Okay, then below that image, but still in that div, let's have like a heading level four uh, with the author's name. So just props.data.authorName. Let's give that a save and see what that gets us. Whoops, the good news is that Next.js error reporting is so good, I immediately know what my mistake was. So there is no uh, property named author photo. So if you just go back into our text editor, instead of author photo, it's just data.photo. Let's give that a save. Ah, so now it looks like medium doesn't exist. This is because the image that I uploaded was so small, the only size that's available. So if you run into this same error, instead of medium, it would be thumbnail. Now, if you uploaded a really large, high-resolution photo, then medium would have been available. But we can go ahead and save that, give it a try. Cool, there's my photo. Uh, there's my author name. There's the text. Looking good. At this point, let me just fine-tune the styling a bit. Uh, so this uses like a circle, and I'm also going to use creative positioning so that my name kind of sits on top of my photo, but also it's positioned so it's sort of halfway hanging off the bottom of this component. So here's what I would do. The div that's housing the image in the H4, let's say class name equals absolute bottom dash zero left dash one slash two, like one half. Uh, let's say transform and then dash translate for a negative or, you know, like a minus, like a negative value. So dash translate dash X horizontally dash one slash two and then translate dash y dash one slash two. All right, and then on the image element, let's give that some a few classes. So class name equals width so w dash h2 h dash 32 rounded full border dash four say border gray dash 200. And then for the label text or you know the author name, let's say class name and that can be absolute, bottom dash zero, left one dash two, transform, negative translate, dash x, one dash two, bg gray 200, shadow, px3. I realize this is not easy to follow along with. I'll include a GitHub repo link so you can just reference my code, but for anyone who's never used Tailwind before, I thought it might be fun to see this uh, you know, detail by detail. Font dash bold, uh, rounded full, and text gray 800. Let's give that a save. Cool. So that takes care of the testimonial component. And, and again, you could have multiple uh, testimonials and then you can drag and drop and reorder them, you know, in between the rich text, so on and so forth. Uh, now let's build out the spoiler component. It's going to be fun to set up because it has interactivity, right? Uh, we're not going to show or reveal the text until you click on a button. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, in the components folder, jump into spoiler.jsx. Now, up at the very top, we're going to say, quotes, use client. And the reason we're doing this is because this component has interactivity, right? We need client-side logic. So we're going to say import curly brackets, use state, and that's from the React package. All right. Now, inside of our function, our main function, let's create a piece of state uh, that keeps track of whether you've like expanded or revealed the spoiler text so far. So we'll say const square brackets, let's say like show spoiler, and that will be either true or false. Like, are you showing it yet? Comma set show spoiler. 
Let's set that to equal and then call use state and give it a default value of false. Like don't show it when you first come to the page. All right, now on the overall did, well, first of all, let's have parentheses so we can have multiple lines of HTML or JSX. Let's have a wrapper div and let's give it class name of BG gray 200, uh, give it a bit of padding, give it rounded corners, say relative, overflow hidden, not pros. Cool, now inside the div, uh, let's start by just having the text that will be hidden a bit later, but let's just display it before we worry about having it hidden. So I'll say like div and it can have a class of like text dash extra large. And then inside there, it would just be curly brackets. And then we need to have props. So in the parentheses for our function, say props. And then back in our slug file, we would need to pass the dynamic data into our spoiler component. So uh, I would just say again, like data equals item. Just a really quick note, when you're looping through a collection, React does want each element to have a key. So I'd probably just say key and use the incoming index. And I would do that for all of our data types. So key index, key index. Let's give that a save and go back into spoiler. And now we can actually receive that incoming data. So down here, it would just be what, props dot data dot, we named it actual spoiler. Cool, so there's the spoiler text. And now let's do this. Let's have this be really bold um, so that you really can't see it. And then we can have a button right about here that you click on that reveals it or unblurs it. Here's how I would make that happen. So this element that currently has text XL, we just wanna give this a conditional class of blur only if, you know, depending on the true or false nature of this property. So here's how you can do that. Uh, for the class name, instead of quotes, let's use curly brackets for a JavaScript expression. And now we can have quotes, but then after the quotes, we can, you know, say plus and then have something dynamic based on a value. So I'd have parentheses. Now let's give our baseline styles first. So text XL and then transition and then duration dash 300. Uh, but then inside these parentheses, the conditional part, I would just say like exclamation show spoiler so like only if this is set to false then what do we want to do so question mark uh we would want the class of blur and now i'd probably just add a space at the end of this string so then when this string gets added on it you know there's a space and it works could have also included a space right here uh, but then let's say colon and then uh, if that's not true then just don't add anything so now we can save that Perfect, so you cannot read this. The spoiler is you know, protected. And now let's just have a button right here that when you click on it, we set show spoiler to true. So here's what I would do. Above our inner div, uh, but still in the overall div. So right here, let's have a button and inside it, curly brackets, let's say props.data.clickable text. Cool, so we filled it, you know, show secret info. Now let's style that so that it looks like a button. So I would just say class name BG gray 500. Uh, when you hover over it, maybe BG gray 600. Uh, text white, rounded large, PX4 for padding, vertical padding. Uh, let's have it sit on top of the blurred text. So a Z index, you know, higher than zero. Let's have it absolute. Let's say top dash one half. Uh, let's say left dash one half. And then to have it actually centered horizontally, pull it back to the left half of its own size. So transform, you know, negative or dash, translate dash x dash one half. And then the same thing, pull it up half of its own height so that it actually looks centered. So I'd say dash translate dash y one half. Let's give that a save. Cool. I think that looks good. Uh, so now we just need to set it up so that when you click it, we change that true or false value. So that's simple enough. On the opening tag, we can just say on click equals curly brackets. We haven't created this function yet, but let's call it like handle click. And then up here, uh, we can just have a function with that name. So handle click parentheses curly brackets. We want this function to be nested inside of this function uh, because we wanna be able to access these variables. So when this function happens, we're just gonna flip this value to be the opposite of whatever it currently is. So we're gonna use this to change that value. So set show spoiler. 
parentheses to call it, work with the previous value, arrow symbol, and then just set it to whatever the opposite, so exclamation of what it previously was, so sort of like a toggle. So if I save that and refresh, uh, so now when I click this button, awesome, now you can read the text. Now let's set this up so that once the text is visible, uh, this button disappears and instead maybe we just have an icon uh, of like a vision or eyeball icon uh, that you could click to sort of re-blur it if you wanted to. So here's how I would make that happen. Let's take that button that we just set up and cut this into your clipboard. You're going to want it back in about five seconds from now. And in its place, we can say curly brackets. It'll have a condition. I'll say exclamation show spoiler. So only if it's false and then and 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 then parentheses. In the parentheses, you can paste back in your clipboard. So this will only be included in your HTML output if that's the case. So now, uh, if you refresh, you do need to refresh to clear the state of the application, right? So that it's back to false. But when you click that, it's gone. Now let's just set up a re uh, like a re-blur or re-hide button up here. So here's what I would do. Below that, I'd set up a new condition. And you know, if show spoiler is true, and and parentheses, and now just include a new button. So I'd have a button element. In between the opening and closing tag, I want an SVG icon. Now, if you visit heroicons.com, I believe this is put out uh, by the folks behind Tailwind CSS, but I'm using the mini size. And then there's this icon called I dash slash. Uh, it looks, you know, something like this. So if you hover over that and click copy JSX, cool, it's in our clipboards. So and then you can just paste it in right there. And then on the opening button tag, I would just say uh, class name uh, equals absolute, top dash two, right dash three, text gray. Let's go with 500. And then we do need to add a handle click. So I just say on click uh, would again just be handle click. So again, that's just going to flip it or toggle it. Let's save that and give it a try. So I can reveal it. Now we have this icon up here. If I click that, awesome, it reblurs it. Cool. So we have just created an interactive component that is pulling real dynamic data from an API. I mean, this is really cool. Next.js is making this very easy. Um, it's client-side React. It's server-side data fetching. This is just awesome. If we scroll back up to the very top of this page, uh, before we worry about having dynamic data for home and about us, let's first set up this top area to be sort of a banner uh, for this individual pet. Let me show you what I have in mind. So I want to display their name in a nice large headline. I want the image of them sort of faded in a you know background color. And then I want a link that says like back to all team members that would you know take you back to this screen. So let's go back to the Meows a lot detail screen. Let me show you what I have in mind here. To set this up, we want to go back to our slug page.jsx file and scroll down to our JSX area. And inside the overall div, uh, let's have a new div. Inside of that, we're going to have a heading level two and an image. So the heading level two can just be their name. So that would be, you know, member.name. And then below that, we're going to have an image. Now, we no longer need member name or member description in the heading level three here. Cool. So this is our banner div and this is our, you know, our body content pros div. So on the heading level two, let's say class name. Let's go with text dash, uh, you know, 6XL font dash bold relative uh, Z index of 30. And we're making it relative in a Z index so it can sit on top of the image that's going to sit behind it. Right now on the image, let's give that a source of you know, curly brackets and then back ticks, HTTP colon colon slash local host colon the port number is 1337 and then dollar sign curly brackets. Let's say member dot photo dot formats dot medium dot URL. All right. Now on the div that houses just the heading level two in the image, let's make that look like a banner area. So I would say like uh, text dash white. Uh, relative positioning, BG gray 700. Let's give it horizontal padding. Let's give it vertical padding. And let's save that and see what that gets us. So we're almost there. I'm actually going to give this uh, this area, this dark background area, negative margin so that it sits flush against this container. 
but we keep this padding for the rest of the content. Let me show you what I have in mind here. So on that container, you can give it negative margin and tailwind by just saying dash for a negative value and then like mx-8. So that's left on the right. Then let's give it negative top margin. So that's dash mt7. Give that a save. Cool. So now it sits flush with the container. Uh, now we just need to get creative and set this image to use absolute positioning. Let's set it to sit right about here and let's uh, give it a filter so that it's uh, sort of transparent and maybe put like a gradient on top of it. So it sort of just like fades into this gray color. Here's how I would accomplish that. So on the image element, we can just start giving it classes. So class name equals, let's go with object cover, absolute positioning, put it in the top zero, bottom zero, so it's full height, uh, left one half, right zero, let's tell it to be block. Let's give it a width of 50%, so width dash one half. Uh, let's tell it to be full height. Let's set its opacity to halfway uh, transparent. Let's say filter grayscale. See what that gets us. That's almost what I want. Uh, now, I'd probably just add a div uh, right about here that's a gradient between, you know, this gray color and transparent so that it looks like this image is sort of like faded or blended in. So here's how I would do that. Right below the image element, but still in that overall div, I just have a new div. And you can just say div dot to give it classes. Let's go with absolute. You can hit tab and then you can just keep adding on to that. Let's say a Z index of 20 so it sits on top of the image, uh, but 20 is less than 30 so it'll sit behind the headline text. Let's give it a width of like 80. Let's say BG gradient to the right direction uh, from gray 700 to transparent. Uh, let's give it full height. Let's put it in the top zero, bottom zero and in from the left, one half. Give that a save. I think that looks really nice. Now let's add a link right about here that takes you back to all team members. Here's how I would set that up. First of all, in this file, uh, up at the very top, I'd be sure to import link from uh, next slash link. All right, and then let's scroll back down. And then in between the div with the heading and the image and our pros div, so in between that, like right here, uh, I would just have a new div. So div, I'll give it a class of transform and then also uh, dash translate y one half to pull it up. You'll see what this is going to create in just a moment. But inside that div, I would have a link and just say ampersand l a q u o semicolon back to all team members and just give that an href of, you know, slash oops, our team. Cool, and then on that link element, let's just make it look like a button or a link. So I'd say class name, let's go with text dash small bg gray 600, uh, text gray 400. Uh, let's go when you hover over it, bg gray 500. And uh, when you hover over it, the text can become gray 300. Uh, inline block, rounded corners, a little bit of vertical padding, a little bit of horizontal padding. Cool, so that looks really nice, but I think I must have a typo in translate because I'm trying to pull it up half of its own height so that it looks like, you know, it's sitting halfway on this banner and halfway on the page. So let's go back and look at our code. Yep, I spelled translate wrong. So not transalte, we want translate. Beautiful. I can click it to go back to view all. Uh, now, off camera, I added a third pet and I also added a bit of uh, body content for Barks a lot. Uh, there's a bit of caching going on, so to see the new results, you can hold down shift on your keyboard and then click the reload icon. Cool, so I added this new cat. You can click on that. Looks good. There's a spoiler. Beautiful. We can go back to all members, click on Barks a lot. You do need to clear the cache. Uh, cool. Well, you can see I would need to provide an image that maybe is you know, a bit more or less tall for the aspect ratio, but you get the idea. At this point, we have an our team area that is completely dynamic, pulling from a real data source. This is really cool. Before we close out this video though, let's do a few more things. Let's set up a single content type for our homepage and also a single content type for our about page. And they can just use rich text, you know, for paragraphs, lists, and headings. 
So to set that up in Strapi, uh, you would just go to Content Type Builder, and we've already seen collection types, we've already seen components, but we have not seen single types. So this is a perfect use case. You would just click Create New Single Type, and let's call it like Home Page. I would click Continue. Uh, really, it just needs one field, and that is a rich text, uh, this blocks option, the new modern rich text. Uh, I would just call it content, click finish. I would click save in the top right corner, and I'm going to go do the same thing uh, for the about page. So just right here, create new single type, just one more type. Let's call it like about page, click continue. All it needs is rich text, hit content, hit save. You also could have created a new collection type called Pages, but in this case, where it's really obvious that it's just a single instance, I think this also works nicely. Before we move on though, let's not forget to set the permissions. Uh, so in the bottom corner, click on Settings, and then down here, click Roles, click on the Edit icon for Public, and we just want to click on About Page, and set Find to be allowed, and then also for Home Page, set Find to be allowed. Click Save in the top right corner, Awesome. Now you can go author a little bit of content. So go to Content Manager. So here you can choose between, you know, about page or home page. I'm just going to copy in a little bit of lorem ipsum. Uh, so for the about page, I'll just maybe start with a heading level one and say, this is the about page. And then have a couple paragraphs. Uh, you know, and you could bold some text. You can italicize some text. Cool. Let's click publish. I'll do the same thing for the home page. So I'll say, you know, like heading level one, welcome, and then a paragraph or two. Cool, let's click publish. Now let's go fetch this dynamically in Next.js. So for example, like our home page, uh, in the root of your project, just in the app folder, uh, we want page.jsx. Cool, so up at the very top of this file, whoops, at the very, very top, let's import uh, the Strappy Blocks renderer for rich text. So I'd say blocks renderer inside curly brackets uh, from, you know, at symbol Strappy. There's the autocomplete blocks re react renderer. Cool, then outside of this function, let's create a function that fetches that data. So I'll say like async function uh, get, I'm just making this up, that's not a reserved name. Uh, but then in there, we would say const, you know, like res or response or promise. Let's await and then just fetch the content. So quotes. And then the easiest way to know for sure what the URL would be would just go back into your settings uh, and then roles and edit that permission. And when you click on, like, for example, like, let's start with homepage. When you click on the little setting icon for find, it's going to let you know the URL pattern right there. So it's API slash homepage. So this would be... HTTP, and then, I mean, if you hosted Strappy on a real domain, uh, or if you used online Strappy, your URL would be different, but ours is just localhost colon 1337 slash API slash homepage. Then we would await the JSON, so, you know, we could say like const home equals await response and use the JSON method, and then ultimately return that. So I would say return home dot data dot content. Now, down in our actual, you know, React component function, uh, we could just say, like, const content equals, and then just await and call our function. Then we can actually use this. Now, if we're, again, if we're going to use await here, you would want to include the word async here. Okay, but then down here, the wrapper div, all it needs is a class name of pros and maybe, like, maxed with none. And then we don't need the hard-coded h1 or p. We just need to call or include the component of blocks renderer with a prop of content and just set that to, you know, our content variable. Let's save that, go back and refresh. Oh, you don't even need to refresh. Awesome. So now our home page is powered by real dynamic data. Someone who's not a programmer can very easily go change and update that. Let's do the exact same thing for our about us page. So we can save ourselves a lot of typing by just, I would literally just copy this entire contents of this file, select everything, go into the about us page.jsx, delete that all, paste it in, and then the only thing you need to change is the URL we're fetching from. So this would be about page. Let's give it a save. Absolutely beautiful. Now at this point, before we bring the video to a close, I do want to briefly talk about how you could actually host or deploy or, you know, 
go live with a project like this. So if, and this is a big if, but if your Strapi installation was not just existing locally on your personal computer, but it was actually up on the web on a real domain, either on Strapi's infrastructure or you were hosting it yourself on you know, a VPS or server, then literally all you would need to do to go live with your Next.js site is just push all of your Next.js files up to a GitHub repo and then connect your GitHub account to a Vercel account and then just you're already done. Like Vercel is going to handle your Next.js site beautifully, perfectly, and you're already done. So that would be the real world scenario, right? Where your Strapi is actually online and your non-programmer clients can log into it anytime they want and, you know, contribute content. So that would be ideal because then anytime those uh, contributors update your content, your Next.js website just automatically pulls in the latest data, you know, from those API endpoints. However, in our case, you know, for the purposes of this video, our Strapi installation only exists on our local computer. So it would not be online or available to our live deployed Next site in order to pull data from. So in our situation, just so this video can end with you deploying your Next site if you wanted to, let's instead uh, sort of set up our Next site like a static site generator, right? Because we do, you and I do have access to our local host version of Strapi. So let's just create sort of a static output um, of, you know, like static HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and images. And that way you can take that output folder and you could host it anywhere, right? Like you could host it on Netlify or Vercel or GitHub pages. Well, GitHub pages probably wouldn't work uh, because your sites don't live at the root of a domain. You know, they're in a subfolder. But any static server that uh, would live at the root of a domain, this will work for. Now again, you'd be losing a lot of the cool server-side benefits of Next.js, so you wouldn't want to go this totally static route unless you needed to, but in our case, with our current setup, we sort of need to do this. So here's what you do. Uh, in Next.js, uh, in the root of our project folder, we're just going to create a configuration file, and it needs to have this exact name. So next.config.mjs. In this new file, let's say export default, and then just give it an object. And let's say output should be export. So output export comma, and then let's also say trailing slash and set that to true. All right, go ahead and save that file. Okay, and now before we try to build or export a static copy of our site, we do need to make one crucial change. So do this with me. In our team and then in our slug folder, go into page.jsx. All right, so before we were trying to create a static site generator version of our site, um, we were able to fetch the current pet that you've navigated to by the incoming param. And that could truly happen on the fly. Like no matter what, I mean, there's a billion infinite number of um, like individual URLs that someone could try to visit. And we were looking up that data server side on the fly. We didn't need to know it ahead of time. However, if we're creating an entirely static copy of our site, we do need to know every possible URL ahead of time and create it again ahead of time. There is no server side action or real time action that can take place. So let me explain what we need to do here. In our slug page.jsx file, maybe right above our default function here, we need to export an async function. Well, it doesn't need to be async, but 99% of the time it's probably gonna be async. But it needs to have this exact name. It needs to be generate static params, parentheses, curly brackets. Now again, you only need this function in Next.js if you're creating a statically generated site, right? Where you cannot look up data on the fly server side. Now what we need to do in this function is return an array of every possible slug value um, that could come after the end of our team. Now you and I know that that's just meows a lot, barks a lot, and purrs loud. But imagine if you had like 500 team members. So you're just essentially providing an array of all the possible URLs. So here's what I would do. If you go into page.jsx for the all team member listing, uh, we already have a bit of code. We have this function called get all team members. 
I would literally just borrow that entire function, copy it into my clipboard, and back in this file, uh, I would just paste it right here. Whoops, and we actually don't need like the wrapper around the function. I just wanted, you know, these three lines of code that fetch that data, that promise. Okay, but then in terms of what this function needs to return, it needs to return an array. So here's what I would do. After members.data, I would say dot map, and then I would say member, give it an arrow symbol. Whoops, member arrow symbol, curly brackets. And we're just going to return an object with a property of slug and then just give it member.slug. Let's give this a save. So now, uh, Next.js will know, like in our case, I only have three team members, but if you had 300, it's going to have an array with all the possible URL values so it can generate all of the HTML files ahead of time. So let's save that. And now, in the command line, you can press Control c to stop the current task. And we're going to attempt uh, npm run build. Should only take maybe like 10, 12 seconds. Cool. So what did that do? Well, it created this brand new folder in your sidebar called out, uh, as in like output. Now, uh, if you try to preview some of these files, I don't believe it'll work if you just like literally double clicked uh, the file on your hard drive because it's going to be looking for your assets at the root of a domain. Uh, but let me show you how I like to preview them. You can go into your command line and type this out. Say npx serve and then just uh, the out folder. So npx serve out. Cool. So now you can just visit localhost 3000 to preview those static files. Looks good. So you can refresh. Uh, you can click around our site. There is just one problem though. So it looks like our images are working, but that's only because our strappy uh, local host is still running. Let me explain what I mean. If I go to my terminal where strappy's running and I press control C, so now local host strappy is not running. And now if I refresh, those images are not actually available. So this is what would happen if you tried to deploy or go live with your static out folder. Now, again, in the real world, I wouldn't have Strappy probably only on my local host. I would use Strappy's official online solution, or I would host my own Strappy instance on like a $5 a month VPS. But in this case, here's what I would do. I'd probably just write my own script uh, that manually copies over all images from the Strappy folder into my Next.js folder. This is gonna be a lot easier than it sounds, trust me. Let's press Control C. And we just need to install one package that's gonna make that a little bit easier. Let's say npm install fs-extra. This is not necessary, it's just what I'm used to doing, but cool. Now, in our uh, the root of our folder, I would just create a new file. You could name it anything, but I'll name it like copyimages.js. All right, in this new file, I'll say like const fs equals, and then just require fs-extra. All right, and now I'm just going to create an async function, and you can name it anything. I'll call it like copy folder. Uh, have it two parameters of like source and target. So the folder that we want to copy, and like where do we want to copy it to? Uh, curly brackets. Let's have a try and a catch block. Uh, in the try, let's just await uh, fs dot. First of all, let's start with a clean slate. Let's remove uh, the existing target so that each time you run this, um, it would delete any old files. You're getting a fresh copy. And then I would await file system copy source comma target. And then for the catch block, we could say like parentheses error. If there's an error, just console.error the error. All right, and then down here, we can actually uh, leverage that. So I'd probably say like const source directory. And for now, let's just say quotes. And then I'd say like const target directory equals quotes. And then I would use my function. So I'd say copy folder, source directory, target directory. So now this is gonna be different um, depending on your computer, like where did you store your files? And there's definitely a more like operating system agnostic way of making this work. <laughs> but it, just a quick and dirty solution, what I would do is find the directory I'm wanting to copy. So in my case, that's this our backend folder. Remember that's where we installed Strappy and then in public, and then in upload. So I want this uploads folder. That's what contains all of our uploaded files. So what I would do, it's probably a better way of doing this, but I would just say CD and then drag that folder into my terminal. 
and then say, you know, PWD for print working directory. So that's uh, the path that I want to copy from. So for source directory in these quotes, I would just paste in my clipboard. And then I would just do the th same thing for where I want to like essentially copy it to. So I want to copy it into our project. Uh, let's create, and it needs to have this exact name of public. And then in that public folder, you know, we would want a folder called uploads. Cool. Then I would just go into a terminal, click CD space, and then drag that folder. I'm just trying to get its absolute path, hit PWD, just copy that into my clipboard. So that's the target directory of where I want to copy it to. All right. So now we can save that file and test it out. So in your command line, you can just say node. We named it copyimages.js. Now you can see if it worked by going into your public folder and let's, there you can see there's an uploads folder or even in file explorer. All right. Here's our next JS inside of public. Now I have uploads. There are all the files. Beautiful. So you could just manually run that anytime you're wanting to create a statically generated copy of your site. Now we do need to go and adjust our image elements to, uh, you know, point towards that instead. So to fix that, I would just go into the Our Team, not in Slug yet, but just the Our Team that lists all uh, team members. And we're just looking for image. So for the source attribute, instead of, you know, HTTP localhost, well, you don't need the HTTP. This could literally just be the dynamic part. And if we're not mixing static text with a dynamic part, you don't even need the template literal. So you could get rid of all of that, get rid of the closing backtick and the closing curly bracket. It could just be this. Uh, so you could save that and then you'd want to do the same thing for an individual pet. So in the slug page.jsx, we're looking for the image. Here it is source. So again, you wouldn't need the back tick so you could get rid of that. You wouldn't need the dollar sign curly brackets. You wouldn't need the closing back tick or extra curly brackets. Cool. I would save that. And then the only other place where you would need to adjust that is in components. Uh, we would want to do that for testimonial as well. So again, get rid of this. Uh, get rid of the closing backtick and curly bracket. Oops, we don't need the starting uh, backtick either. So you could save that. Uh, and now here's how we're going to test that out. Just run an npm run build. It's building up uh, a new fresh copy. That's going to automatically take the public files and put them in your out folder. And now to test that, you would just say, let's go back up to the top of the screen. You would just say npx serve the out folder. All right, let's go test it out at uh, localhost 3000. Absolutely beautiful. So now you have a static folder and yes, we're not getting all the benefits of server side next and server side react, but it is a single page application, right? You can click this down in the footer. It's going to persist that memory as you navigate around. Uh, you can go to individual URLs. You can use the br browsers back and forward buttons. We, you know, maybe you have like a thousand team members and we dy dynamically generated this entire site. So this is still a really cool experience, right? And if you want to go live with it, well, you now have this folder. Uh, it's just out and you can place these files on any basic server. That is going to bring this lesson to a close. Thank you so much for watching until the very end here. Once again, I want to say a big, huge thank you to Strappy for sponsoring this video. This wasn't just my typical, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 minute YouTube tutorial. I wanted to create something of immense value with this tutorial and Strappy made that possible by sponsoring this video. We saw in this video how amazing Strappy is and if for your next project you're looking for a content management system that your non-developer or non-programmer teammates can contribute to, go ahead and consider Strappy. It's an amazing tool. They have affordable pricing plans where they host the installation for you. They make it as easy as possible. It's a great system. It's a great service. Anyways, thanks again for watching this video. Let me know down in the comments if you would like to see a tutorial on how to host your own Strappy instance, maybe on a VPS, or if there's any other uh, big features in Next.js you want to see covered on the channel. Thank you so much for sticking around until the very end. Take care, and I'll see you next time.